Good afternoon. My name is Esther Mannheimer. I'm the mayor of the city of Asheville, and I'd like to welcome you to the city council interviews for the reparations commission. All council committee members and interviewees are participating virtually. We are streaming live on our virtual engagement hub, which is accessible through the virtual engagement hub link on the front page of the city's website. We also have an option for the public to listen live by phone by dialing 855-925-2801. Today, we'll be holding a total of 18 10-minute long interviews for the five council appointments to the Reparations Commission. Once the appointments are final, the full commission will be made up of 25 members, five council appointments included, and five county commissioner appointments included. The remaining 15 representatives will be selected by the neighborhoods of areas with significant impact. Just as a reminder to folks, uh, we ask that applicants um, designate impact areas and those five impact areas are criminal justice, economic development, education, healthcare, and housing. In other words, we asked applicants to tell us what area, impact area, they think their application falls under. The Reparation commissions, uh, Commission will be empowered to make short, medium, and long-term recommendations that will make significant progress toward repairing the damage caused by public and private systemic racism. Candidates uh, on this call today with us, please refer to the countdown timer displayed in the virtual meeting room. And please mute yourself and turn off your camera until it is your turn to be interviewed. Um, so folks, the appointments will actually be made um, at our next city council meeting. That is on February 22nd at 5 p.m., which will be our first in-person meeting in a long time and will take place at Harris Cherokee. Um, AKA the Civic Center. So with that, we are going to begin with our first candidate, Karen Teal. And Karen, if you could um, um, look around my screen, I think you're there somewhere. Um, if you could just begin by telling us a little bit about yourself, why you'd like to serve on the Reparations Commission and what impact area uh, you designated in your application. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. <clears throat> um, I am a retired educator. Uh, I was a, a middle school um, world and U.S. history teacher. And then I taught French for a number of years. This is all in California, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And then I became a, I, then I um, went to graduate, graduate school, got my doctorate in education at UC Berkeley. Um, focusing on, as it, as it turned out over the years, the education of African-American students. Uh, I, um, after I finished my, my doctorate, I uh, went back into the classroom and I uh, found that I was struggling with my mostly all African-American students. So I invited a, a colleague, a fellow student who um, was in the same doctoral program at UC Berkeley Jennifer Obida to um, come into my classroom to coach me. She is a black woman, uh, grew up in Barbados and uh, had a master's in African-American studies from Yale. And anyway, we worked together. She, she came in my classroom to coach me. We worked together for three years and um, ended up writing a couple of books about, of our, out about our experience. Uh, it was an incredibly eye-opening um, and um, transformative experience for me because of uh, uh, having to face my own racism uh, and that that explained, uh, partly explained why I was struggling with my students to support them and uh, encourage them and to have a, good, uh, a really good relationship with them. Uh, so um, after uh, living in California for my whole life, uh, I ended up moving here to Asheville six years ago. Um, oh, I meant, I meant to say that uh, after I was working in, the, in my classroom with seventh and eighth graders, I um, uh, started working as a professor at a, a university in Oakland, California, uh, working with graduate students uh, who are becoming teachers and masters and doctoral students uh, and 
we are preparing them to work with uh, students in the inner city of Oakland. Uh, so that went on for several years. I was a single subject credential coordinator. And um, so then uh, a lot of other things happened in my life and I ended up uh, deciding to move to Asheville. I, my entire family, three adult kids and six grandchildren live on the East Coast. And my brother and his wife live here too. Uh, and um, I uh, found when I, after moving here and, and wanting to um, get involved with the African-American community, um, I noticed in, uh, amazing segregation in the city and wanted to better understand that. I uh, learned about um, Dr. Dwight Mullen's State of Black Asheville program at UNCA. Um, heard him interviewed on the radio, uh, actually by a <laughs> colleague of mine at the university in, in Oakland. And uh, that was that was incredibly enlightening. And uh, um, my, my journey here has been to learn more about what is going on with race relations here in Asheville and um, and what the situation is for African-American residents. Um, and, you know, I've learned so much about uh, the past, uh, the urban renewal, the impact that it had on black residents. Uh, and um, I started getting involved with different organizations. I took the Building Bridges course, which uh, went over several months. Um, this is all pre-pandemic. I um, got involved with the NAACP and I uh, was at a session there where um, the superintendent and assistant superintendent of schools uh, talked about the achievement gap in the Asheville schools. Um, you know, something that I had learned about and been working, trying to address myself as a classroom teacher and then as a professor in California. But it, of course, it was happening here as well. Um, so I um, reached out to the assistant superintendent of schools at that time, Dr. Dick Dickerson, uh, wrote a letter asking if uh, we could get together and talk about my experience and, um, you know, what, what I had done in uh, California as an educator and some ideas I had about addressing the achievement gap. Uh, I also reached out to um, April, April Dockery, I believe her name is, uh, the principal of Asheville Middle School about uh, somehow getting involved there. But soon after that, the COVID came along and of course shut everything down. So at that point, I decided to, to uh, really work on my own um, understanding of my own racism and to learn more about uh, the uh, black community here in Asheville. So I um, continued to participate in the NAACP. I uh, um, got involved with the Racial Equity Institute. Um, I, oh, I forgot to mention that I'd also reached out to the, to the um, uh, Delta House uh, and Shirley Whiteside to see if I could work uh, with them. This was again, pre-pandemic <clears throat> and Open Door Asheville with Dusty Bari um, to see if I could get involved with that. So my, my goal was to try to become more familiar with what was going on here, try to get involved with the uh, Ash, the black community here and to see what I could do to make any kind of a difference in my own individual way as a white ally, really. Um, and um, along with the uh, uh, Racial Equity Institute, I was involved with the Racial Justice Coalition, different programs that they had. All of this was, of course, uh, um, online and Zooming. Um, I joined a a group called Aware LA, the Alliance of White Anti-Racists Everywhere, uh, the Keep It Moving Coalition. That was a, it's a spinoff from the building, as you sure you know, Building Bridges and Racial Equity Institute workshops. 
Um, and uh, I have been very involved now in the um, with the Asheville Community Theater. We're under, we're undergoing some um, diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Uh, we went through a training all summer long with uh, Alexandria Ravenel and David Greenson, um, their collaborative organizing group. We're still working with them. Now, um, a smaller group of us has uh, is continuing, it's called the Cultural Change Agent Team, to try to bring about a cultural shift in the, in, um, the theater on every level. Um, and uh, my passion for uh, theater is all part of that. Ms. Uh, yes. You have, um, um, you have a few questions. I think a few councilwomen would like to ask questions. Okay. Uh, can jump in? Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much uh, for your time today, Dr. Teal. Um, I find your resume um, fascinating um, and I appreciate your efforts relating to equity. Um, my question might be a little poignant, but I think you can deal with it based on what you said earlier about confronting your own racism. Um, because you have been in academia, I wonder, have you heard of the book, Nice White Ladies? Are you familiar with that book? Oh, okay. It's a book essentially about, well, the subtitle is The Truth About White Supremacy, Our Role in It, and How We Can Dismantle It. And one um, section of the book that I found particularly interesting was the role white women play in education um, and in instances actually uh, increasing uh, racial disparity in the school system. Um, I think we're all aware that there is a um, opportunity, sometimes we call it an achievement gap in Asheville City Schools. Have you given thought to how you as um, an educator could play an active role in working with white women in particular to decrease or to cause less harm to African-American students. So you're talking about working with white teachers in the Asheville schools? Sure, or bringing to light the role that perhaps seemingly, even seemingly well-intentioned people play in increasing dis, um, disparities. Yeah, well, and I learned that about myself uh, as I worked with um, Jennifer Obida in my classroom. And um, then we went, to the, went around the country talking about the work we'd done together. We even went to South Africa, which was amazing. And um, uh, talked, to, talked to large groups of white teachers who we were meeting with. Um, it, was, it was pretty sobering and uh, uh, upsetting because there was a lot of resistance. Um, I got hate letters. Uh, I got uh, people calling me out, white teachers calling me out during these presentations about how dare I accuse them of being racist and um, not being understanding their black students and being able to support them. And I, I said, I'm not, I'm not talking about anybody else but myself. And this has been my experience. And this is what I'm, I'm sharing with you in case you resonate with it. And so that would be what I would, I would jump at the opportunity of doing that, uh, working with white teachers, if they were willing, ready and willing to um, go through that same journey that I went through and I'm still going through and will for my entire life um, to look at their own racism and how it can be contributing to the, um, the lack of achievement if that's what's happening among African-American kids. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, okay, we're over our time. We're gonna move on to the next. Um, thank you very much for joining us, Ms. Steele. We're gonna move on to our next um, interviewee, Cece Weston. And I guess um, I guess I should have made this a little bit clear. Well, there, there may be uh, questions that council members would like to ask. So give us a chance um, if, you know, of course we wanna hear from you, but give us a chance to, um, ask you some questions. And Ms. Weston, if you could also please just um, begin by telling us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in serving on the Reparations Commission and um, and also if you could identify your impact area, which I'm sure you will on talking about yourself. Um, okay. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Cece Weston, and I'm a native of Asheville. I'm actually born here and raised here and grew up in the city school systems and um, went away for, for school and then came back and began my work with Asheville City Schools. Um, I have uh, been working with education since I've been back. So that's been 30 plus years. And uh, the impact, the, the impact, and there's an echo, so it's kind of distracting me. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but the impact that I have experienced has been around education, workforce development, and economic development. And I'm going to explain how that has tied into it. Um, I currently own a learning center, which is the Christine Avery Learning Center, and we serve students ages 2 to 15 years old. And so um, we're catching them at the preschool age, working with them in the elementary age, and also working with the students in the middle school age. And what I've seen over the years is that students um, who are in the elementary and middle schools have a really difficult time in the school system. They may create certain behaviors that the schools have a difficult time working with the students with, but when they come to our program, we don't see any of those behaviors. And so my question was, why is it that we don't see the behaviors that the schools see with, from those students? And um, the solution that I came up with is that there are not enough African-American teachers in the school system. We'd like to look at also the curriculum that's involved with, uh, the, teacher, with, with the students and what they are learning. And they don't learn enough about who they are as people. And so what we try to do in our program is to give those students more education about who they are, where they come from, and how they can better connect with the communities that they're living in. So um, we start that at the ages two to five, the preschool age. We start implanting in our students uh, who they are, how important they are. They're beautiful. They can learn. And those are things that we include in our curriculum. Um, how does that, how does our impact tie into workforce development? Again, with our program, we have natives of Asheville, African Americans, mostly on our staff, who have been um, pretty much shut out. Uh, I think uh, there is a teacher on our staff who's been with our program for five years who did not have the opportunity to go to school to receive the credentials that are required by early learning programs. And so what we have done is rallied around her and provided a way for her to go to school. So the economic was not there for her. And so what we're trying to do is take those people who have been impacted by economics and not having what they need to better themselves and create an environment so that they can better themselves. In other programs, I don't think that she would have been able to do that because again, the requirements are there that they should have certain credentials. And because she was not able to do that economically, she probably would have been put out of uh, another program. Um, so that speaks to the economic development and the workforce development. Um, Another thing that I look at in running this program that we have is that um, we don't have the resources that some of our counterparts have. And um, I have to do a comparison because there are other preschool programs in the city that are able to build these fantastic buildings, have these wonderful resources, have this great technology, and we struggle every day to try to make those ends meet. We struggle to try to provide the, the best uh, supplies for our students to learn, for our teachers to work. So we don't have those same opportunities that our coworkers have, or I'll say, I would say our counterparts have in the same field. Um, so that has been a great, great impact uh, on the African-American community, particularly those of us who have small businesses. 
You know, we struggle to find spaces. I think about some of the other programs or other businesses owned by African Americans. We struggle to find spaces. We don't have the economic resources to build these fantastic buildings. We don't have the economic resources to buy the land to build fantastic buildings. So we have to research areas in the community where we can be housed at affordable prices. Um, so that that's where I am. And this is why I'm so passionate about being a part of the reparations um, committee, because I see the impact of the African-American community. And I see the impact of uh, our small businesses owned by African-Americans. And I see the impact of those of us in the neighborhoods who've lost our houses and had to go to other places. So um, I'm open for questions at this time. And council members, please just jump in. Okay. Hi. Hi, Kirsty. Hi, uh, CC. Uh, first of all, I'd like to actually commend you for what you're doing because that is the most important thing you're doing there. You're building a, a foundation for these kids to build on. And that is the problem. We can't, our kids do not have that foundation. And that's what you're doing here. And I, I applaud you with that. Uh, I, I think that um, basically you are on the track that we actually need. And I, and I, I can't, I was listening to you and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, <laughs> that is what is missing. And I greatly appreciate it. Um, I think you would uh, be a great candidate uh, for the reparations committee because you actually live in the area that's impacted. You're around it every day. And when you talked about the small business people and how difficult it is for them, and that's exactly right. It, it is so challenging. And so uh, just having that knowledge and having that experience and knowing what it takes, I really appreciate you applying and uh, and I, I look forward to hopefully you being on the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, Cece, how are you? Hi. This is Shanika. Hi, so you demonstrated quite well the interplay, as an educator, the interplay between economic resource and the a cultured workforce. And it seems like you have piloted this type of idea. Do you have any ideas or strategies on how to roll this out as a possible city project or city program? Sure, um, and, and I'm glad you asked, thank you. Um, one of the things that uh, I see taking place in our city, and I'm gonna talk really fast here, is that when our students graduate from high school, if they get that far, um, and they don't have the opportunity to go to college, and they may not go to the military, then what's left for them to do? Um, and so there's a lot of lag there. There's a lot of uh, lack there. And, and I was thinking that building a project, a program, something, some type of resource to create training opportunities, skill building, um, even offering jobs that provide internships so that they can learn and uh, become productive citizens and walk into better uh, jobs and paying positions. Because right now, when they leave high school, they don't have that opportunity. And so they are left in the streets, which increases the crime in the community. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? This is Kim. Thank you so much for your willingness to participate in this process. I appreciate the work that you're doing in our community. Um, could you speak to what it would look like to have support from the community and from the city of Asheville as you participate in this process? Sure. Um, I would love for the city of Asheville to create an opportunity for small African-American owned businesses to buy land, buy buildings, buy just create a space for us to be able to operate our businesses so that we won't have to struggle for those spaces. You may find that many of the African-American businesses um, end up not operating or have to close because again, spacing is an issue, a place to operate, um, having those upgrades to be able to provide innovation. We just don't have that readily available to us. And so if the city could find that and, and give that to us or even 
make it affordable so that we can move into those spaces and be able to operate our businesses. Thank you so much for joining us here today, uh, Ms. Weston. We're going to move on quickly to our next. Okay, uh, thank you. Know, you. What's going on with this? Oh, the beeping is the end of the, okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you for the countdown staff. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, we're now going to welcome Asandu McPeters. And I'm looking on my screen. I believe I see. Mr. McPeters, um, if you could, um, hello there. <laughs> if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you are um, interested in serving on the commission. Hey, hey uh, my hey, name is Asanda hey. McPeters. Thank you for offering me this time to uh, interview uh, for this commission. I think we've got a little bit of feedback. You might have another, um, if you've Can got. You be, is that better? I think, I think Sandra's mic is open too. Okay. Awesome. All good now. Can y'all hear me? Yes, you are good to go. All right. So thank you for this uh, opportunity. Um, my name is Asandu. I'm from Asheville, North Carolina, born and raised. Um, I went to school at Asheville High, and then I went to uh, college in Tennessee, Knoxville, and moved back to Asheville in about 2005. Um, as far as why I want to serve on this commission, my previous employment uh, was youth and young adult ministry uh, for the Episcopal churches in North Carolina. And uh, during that time is when I began to actually kind of see um, the disparities uh, involved within the community and across the state, uh, you know, for people of color. And so my reasoning for wanting to serve on this commission is, is for a, I guess, a youth and young adult perspective. Uh, I look at the future of, of Asheville uh, and the surrounding you know, city and county, and I want to make sure that the, the youth uh, and young adults that are growing up um, understand, first off, you know, where the cities come from as far as these discussions of reparations and the root causes of, of how they happened, uh, how they are now in ways that we can, you know, work together and come about so that everybody has an equal opportunity for um, circumstances, uh, you know, for, for wealth, for education, uh, as people have said, around those issues. So that's essentially why my, uh, I have some interest in, in serving on the commission. Very, very briefly, um, and good afternoon, and thanks for joining us today. I see mention in your application about previous employment you had in the healthcare field. Can you um, expand on that a little bit, please? Well, yes, ma'am. Uh, so my very first job, I, I worked for Interim Healthcare, uh, and I, I served with people uh, basically helping um, supply CNAs, nurses uh, for home health care. Uh, around the community. Uh, so that was essentially my first job and and I met some connections on people within the healthcare industry and you know helping us to to serve the needs of you know both people in facilities and also for in their homes as far as that care. This is Gwen Whistler. Thanks for thanks for applying. Um, so what well, the, of the five impact areas, what would you, where would you see your biggest impact? And secondly, if you weren't, uh, if you weren't appointed to this commission, what would you see your role out, not being a member of the commission, but how would you try to impact or be involved with the reparations process? Oh, good question. So uh, my current job is I, I work in financials. And so uh, I think my biggest impact could be in, in helping everyone, both youth, young adults, and uh, people within the community on, on how to grow their finance, how to, how to have financial wealth, uh, how to save, uh, you know, the, the pros and cons of, of your finances and how it impacts your day-to-day your, your -day activity. And so I enjoy that. One of my favorite things to do uh, at my current job is to actually lead programs uh, to discuss uh, the importance of, of your financial uh, wealth. So I think that that would be my, my number one. 
Uh, two is I have uh, extensive background uh, knowledge for anti-racism, and um, I, I, I love that I'm able to share the language so that these discussions can actually happen, uh, you know, to build uh, relationships and actually start the process of the work that the commission is looking to do. So I enjoy getting people together and you know, addressing these root causes by first growing together as people, growing our relationships together and building, uh, you know, building the verbiage so that we can actually be on the same ground to talk about these these tough topics. Uh, and then I think third, I, I answered that before, but I, I still uh, tutor and mentor uh, with youth uh, not just in Buckham County because I actually work in Henderson County, but uh, through all uh, Western North Carolina. So my third thing would be helping uh, this commission reach out to uh, the youth uh, so that, you know, we get their, um, we get their involvement in this, in this process as well. You muted. Hi. First of all, how do you pronounce your name? I'm sorry, Asandu? Asandu, yes, okay. ma'am. <laughs> Hi, Asandu. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I noticed that you say you work with the youth uh, ministry, and I would like to know, especially our black male, I'm quite sure the black male youth uh, that you work with a lot of uh, those kids, and I would like to know, what do you think their greatest need is that could sort of actually that we, that, that with the reparations, uh, to come up with something that could actually sort of, um, how could I say, uh, change the trajectory on what uh, they are on as far as, you know, with the, by the way they're right. brought up or whatever and the challenges that they're dealing with, what would you say that we could do to actually change that path? That because I'm quite sure a lot of the young boys are on a path of not really knowing who they are, where they're going, and they just sort of just hang with the crowd and do what, you know, all the other yeah. kids do. How do you change that uh, mindset? I think it varies across the board, but one of my favorite our philosophies with it is, is just it's the mentorship and, and the support. Like most of the kids who, uh, you know, I mentor talk to or, you know, share with in, in the growing of their faith, they're missing uh, somebody that they can actually look up to and talk to that relates to them. So I think that providing uh, support for actually what they're wanting to do, whether it's art, whether it's music, whether it is business, uh, I think being supportive and, and being there. We, we're we in a tough time, and I, I think a lot of people, just like all of us do, is that they look forward to someone uh, to talk to. Uh, so that's that's the first thing. The second thing is that we have to provide real uh, realistic expectations as far as um, what's attainable. I mean, it's cliche to say that, hey, if, if you dream, you can do anything. That is possible, but it's also realistic that not everybody's going to make it to the NBA or the NFL, and not everybody's going to be a millionaire. Not everybody's going to be like a, a rap star, a music star. So I think it's important to why people have dreams uh, is to also prepare them for if those things don't happen, is to have uh, some kind of secondary approach to what it is that you can still be successful uh, with in life. And I think that um, one of the main things with this commission is it is looking at you know, making dreams possible, but also making, whether it's a small business owner or, or having a job where you can fully support yourself and family, uh, making those kind of dreams and insights come true. Because, uh, you know, as we all know, that that ground can sometimes be unequal for uh, for people of, of all colors to attain. So um, the support, the mentorship, but also to help people build those goals so that they can make it in life is one of the things that I think that is missing for, uh, you know, minority and, and people of color uh, children. Hey, well, Shandu, how are you? This is Shanika. Hey, Shanika. I think we were classmates. You may have graduated 97. I was 98, but we're close. Okay, 98, 98. Well, <laughs> you, you gave us a lot of great information. You're definitely a quality candidate. Um, I loved your your experience leading programs 
and your um, your experience of working with youth, do you have any experience um, developing programs? Yeah, so um, when I worked for the Episcopal Church, that was my job is to actually uh, develop trainings, uh, weekends, overnight courses, uh, programs, uh, tutorials, all, all of that just to, to help with faith. So. Uh, for seven years, I was in that role, and even here with my job in financials, I, I still help with, um, you know, building building foundations here for us to continue to grow in. So, uh, I love that. I love working with people to 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 come across uh, programs and activities or information that that's needed so that we can address these topics. And if I didn't mention it before, like I'm I'm very involved with root cause. And so this is a very root cause topic. And so essentially that that's my priority is to get to the root causes of what this has done, what this is created, and essentially how we can overcome to help broaden not only the conversation, but to help people of color, minorities uh, have equal footing. Excellent, thank you. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. That is our time. We're going to um, move on to Dr. Mullins next. Um, thank you again. Uh, Dr. Mullen, uh, welcome to the Asheville City Council interviews for the Reparations Commission. If you could just begin by telling us a little bit about yourself and why you'd like to serve on the commission. Hold on. My video and audio are fine? Yes, Great. yes. Great, I'm uh, uh, Dr. Dwight Mullen and I retired from uh, UNCA as a political scientist and Africana studies professor in 2018. And uh, from 2006 to 2007, um, my students while I was working every year uh, conducted research into uh, data collection, or data mining regarding the state of Black Asheville. Um, and in public policy areas that were covered by the city and by the county, um, it took me um, years to accept that I was never going to get away from this and that it was going to follow me for the rest of my life. And so I started thinking about what to do about it. Um, and, and this seems to me the most appropriate way to address some of the issues that were um, encountered uh, through the data that the students mined. <clears throat> So I'm happy to jump in right now. Dr. Bullen is Antoinette, good to see you. Good to see um, you. And of course, I think everyone knows that my claim to fame has been being your neighbor for at least <laughs> the past 35 years. So it's good to see you today. Um, and looking at your um, application, it's clear to me that frankly, you could fit into any of uh, the impact fields. But I'd like to ask you questions related to two. Those are education and housing. First, I'm going to throw you in quicksand and ask you at from an educational standpoint point, um, your thought of your thoughts concerning the um, opportunity and achievement gap, specifically your thoughts on Asheville City Schools uh, recent decision to close Asheville Primary and Montessori. Uh, keeping in mind, and I'm sure you've heard of the book, Nice Racism, and also Nice White Ladies. That's the first. The second, as it relates to housing, I would love for you to comment on the city's policy of 2080-20, um, 20% affordability at 80% area median income for 20 years. And in that answer, please include your knowledge of the median income for Black folks. That was a lot. You go ahead and start, and then I'll remind you what I asked. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, with education, it's it's problematic because we we we've assumed that education is colorblind, um, and that's been the assumption since the desegregation in the late '60s, early '70s. That if we put the children in one classroom, then the same education will come out equally for all the children. Um, but data indicate that that's just not true. And, and and so we've responded, Asheville City Schools has, has responded over the years by creating different scenarios and programs designed to address the different outcomes that students were having by race and by gender. 
And the school uh, campuses kind of reflect that what we thought we began as a magnet system um, that we would begin addressing uh, the needs of these students more specifically through that system, but that's not what's happened. What's happened is that the successful programs have attracted successful families, while children who have been challenged have been relegated and peripheralized to programs that don't indicate uh, that they have been very successful in meeting these challenges. And so closing campuses and adjustments seem appropriate, but my question is always, not just the closing, but what exactly are we placing, re replacing them with? And for me, what I have found, and I think data can indicate some support for this, is that campuses that are open specifically by the needs of the students and having the courage to also include race and gender in those needs tend to be the most successful in, 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 in closing opportunity gap issues because these campuses don't just address themselves to academic needs. One of the things about the opportunity gap, and it's the same thing in housing, is that the social determinants, the things like employment and health care and the condition of your house and the neighborhood you're in and the idea that um, people who are closest to you are educated, not educated, or various stages of education, those things all interact. They can't be isolated and, and treated sequentially as though they're independent silos. And because of that, Black schools that I have seen address success opportunities are also internally addressing each of those social determinants. And so if those schools are going to be closed, it seems to me the next question becomes what gets opened in their place? Are they really addressing the needs of these children or are we again going through programmatic changes that delay uh, ultimate responsibility? In terms of housing, you know, um, and in terms also of education, you've got to look at median income and, and median income. I am um, I'm contested with, I'm contesting the, 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 the latest data that I saw in that it appears as though uh, um, African-American median income is um, uh, it was, is significantly higher than it was at, during the last census count. During the last census count, um, we were looking at median income for a family of four being right around thirty-three, thirty-two to $34,000. Um, the American Community Survey updated that, um, but it didn't update it too much beyond what the current federal poverty level is. In other words, the median income for black families is just slightly above what the federal poverty level is for black families. The latest data, which I'm contesting though, has that as, has, has, has a significant increase. Um, uh, and it appears as though African-American family income has gone up by $10,000. And um, I'm not willing to accept that. I, I, I think that that's skewed and I'm, I'm checking the data and I found several sources that are also questioning those, those numbers. Um, and that I doubt seriously if African-American median family uh, income is at $45,000 <laughs> for a family of four. Um, but even if it is, we're talking about the effects of gentrification on the African-American community in that it appears to me that the explanation are, migra are migration patterns. People are leaving the city, leaving the county in order to find affordable housing and leaving in their wake those who can stay because they can not afford it. That's the only explanation I can think of for why there would be such a dramatic change in what the data indicator of the family incomes of, of, of black families uh, living here in the city. Um, but that doesn't address even making forty forty five thousand dollars a year, let alone thirty four thousand. That doesn't address the housing's challenges regarding the median selling price of a house. I mean, we're talking three hundred and forty thousand dollars. <laughs> you know, and three hundred forty thousand dollars. If you're making forty thousand dollars, you are not qualifying for a mortgage. And so that that type of crisis in housing, to me, is really indicative of something that I think reparations process um, is is bringing to the forefront. In that, most of most of our my experiences are that it's not that black families and black people are separate and apart and unique, even though we've been peripheralized and segregated and incarcerated and, and enslaved. All those types of histories do apply specifically and harshly to us.
It's not that our outcomes are so unique that they can't be related to. What I find instead is that we are much more likely to be like we like you know the canaries in the mine. Is that the housing challenges and educational challenges that we face are what will be faced by the general population given time. And that's what I find with housing. And that's what I found with education. The same thing is true with healthcare. So would you say then that you could draw a direct line from urban renewal to the current housing crisis? It's a direct line, not just here in Asheville, but from every area in Met uh, that was affected by urban renewal, we can find the same. I just did some work also um, in Oklahoma, and it was the same thing there, the same thing there, direct line between the destruction of the communities and the unaffordability of communities today. You know, I'm looking at this clock tick, so that's why I'm oh. talking so fast. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Who raised their hand? Who was it? This was Sage. Hi, Dr. Hey, Mom. It's Hello, great to see you? you. Thank you so much for considering this application and joining us in this endeavor. Um, I just wanted to clarify the housing numbers and the median income you're talking about. You were talking about local data. At first, I thought you were talking about regional or like the ACS in a larger mm -hmm. way, but you're actually talking about Asheville. And a yeah, 10, yeah. I was working with the IT department with Asheville City, and we both came up with those numbers, and we were so stunned we refused to use them um, because we don't we don't have much faith in, faith in them at all, not at all. <clears throat> any other questions? Well, we don't really have any time. We're at the end here. Thank you, Dr. Mullen, for joining us for this um, interview. We appreciate it. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Okay. Um, next, we're interviewing um, Amy Meyer, and I'm just looking around my screen. I think Do we have Ms. Meyer here. Did you Brenda? miss? It? Did you miss Jessica Beno Benoit? Yes, Benoit. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Brenda, you were trying to tell me that, and I did not understand what you were saying. Okay. I'm sorry. That was my mistake. Um. Ms. Benoit, we're going to go back to Jessica Benoit. And I see that you've joined us, and I'm terribly sorry. I skipped over in my list. Um, if you could just begin by telling us a little bit about yourself and um, why you'd like to serve on the Reparations Commission, and just make sure you're unmuted. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Great. Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for letting me join and be a part of this. Uh, my name is Jessica, and I think I just want to start by stressing that I definitely want to be a part of this that helps lift the black voices that are part of this kind of community outreach. Um, and I think that I have a background that kind of puts me at, you know, in a well suited position to help in any way I can. Um, my educational background, I have a master's in sociology. Um, my professional background. I've spent the last 12 years consulting on brand strategies and specifically I've played a major role in some recent uh, DEI movements. Um, Facebook's Lift Black Voices being one of them. And uh, just a personal interest as well in reparations specifically, as well as giving you know back in any way I can to the Asheville community. Okay, do we have any questions? I see from your res um, your application that you haven't been too long in the city. What specifically made you go, this is my shot, this is my chance? <laughs> yeah, um, well, I've been very passionate, I guess, just in the area of the sociology of inequalities, I guess, uh, my entire life. So I've been a volunteer. Um, I was the Oxfam Action Corps main uh, Chicago leader for a couple of years. So I had to put together and execute several outreach programs for just food security, including lobbying in DC and Chicago to create better food justice systems locally and abroad. Um, so I've just always kind of wanted to dive in and help in any way I can with the communities that I live in and that I'm a part of. Um, and when I was in grad school, like I said, I studied what I dubbed the sociology of inequalities, which all of my professors at the time told me didn't exist. It wasn't a thing. Um, but everything that I studied, I would just find that um, 
that Black Americans were disproportionately affected by everything from, you know, there are more of them affected by poverty and in jail and basically any and every criminal justice uh, topic that I stumbled across, I just kept coming up with these um, inequalities and wanting to do something about it and learning that, you know, a financial priority really is essential in order to get well-rounded impact into other social areas. So, you know, I personally am a big fan of reparations. I do them every payday, just randomly through mutual aid threads. And uh, I'd like to do something that's more specific and more sustainable and more tied to, you know, Asheville and what Asheville's doing to help the Black community. Any other questions? Hi, Jessica, this is Sandra Kilgore. And I just would like to ask you a question, you know, from your perspective, what is it that you think that as far as uh, that you could do uh, or, or points that you could put forward to the reparation committee uh, that could you think could actually benefit the black community? What ideas do you have? Um, well, I think I could help in the sense of how to establish communications strategies specifically. Um, I currently am a consultant with brand strategies and how to execute programs like their DEI values. Um, so in the sense of how to do the outreach into the community and gain support, um, I personally think I would be able to offer a lot of experience with just reaching out to certain groups right now um, who maybe aren't offering the current support that we need in this area and, and helping to change their minds. Thank you. This is Kim. Jessica, I have a preliminary question. Have you had an opportunity to read any of the works within the body of work that is the state of Black Asheville? Black Asheville specifically? No. So I have um, a question that has been elevated by community is, in your opinion, why does the wealth gap currently exist among the Black community in Asheville? I think that stems back to on unfortunately, the way that our country was founded and uh, <laughs> and slavery, and we need to make up for those, you know, inequalities that are wedged into everything. Um, I know I'm not articulating this very well at all, but I mean, I understand why it's important, and I understand that there there's there needs to be a well-rounded solution. And I think that I can be part of it. Um, you know, I know, for example, you know, my corporation did a book club, you know, when there was the George Floyd protest and they wanted to read Right Fragility. And I, you know, I definitely showed up at that book club and I told them that I, that I thought it was a little silly that they read this book. And um, I suggested they should have read at the time me and White's Supremacy by Layla Saad, um, because why listen to a white woman's um, perspective on this when there are plenty of books written by black women talking about this issue? Um, and so honestly, like I, I was torn whether or not I should even show up as a white woman because like, why would you want me on your committee? Um, but I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm not coming at it from like a white savior perspective at all, but more of one of, I think I, understand why these inequalities exist well, rather whether or not I can articulate them well right now. And I'm passionate to do something about it. And I think that I have the skills that can help um, in terms of executing this kind of a program. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you. We appreciate you um, applying and taking time to let us interview you today. Thanks so much. Thanks. Okay.
Okay, now I'm back in order. Um, I'm going to move to Amy Meyer and Ms. Meyer, welcome. If you could just take a moment to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you'd like to serve on the Reparations Commission. Sure. Can you hear me okay? You can. Okay, good. Yes. Um, my computer wasn't working properly, so now I'm on my phone, so I'm a little unsure of how that comes off. Um, who am I and why do I want to work on the Reparations Commission? That's the question. Uh, so I've lived in Asheville. I moved here in 2009 and I raised, I've raised my kids here. My youngest son is a senior at AHS right now and he started at Isaac Dixon, actually started at Asheville Primary. Um, so I am invested in this community and I've seen it grow and change and I love Asheville. I think uh, despite all of our little issues and things like that. It's a pretty darn good community and I love the heart of it. I love the people it attracts. And um, then I started learning a little bit about the history and then felt a lot of pain around that too. But through building bridges, I learned about the, you know, the whole thing of urban renewal and the Charlotte Street and um, how Asheville has had an unfortunate uh, pattern of displacing people of color and um, leaving them in the lurch whenever it comes to financials and property and power management, things like that. So uh, as I was learning that, so that was a few years after moving here, I got more and more involved in the community and had more and more friends of color and of different backgrounds. And then I started working for Mana Food Bank and I really got to know the community more. I worked there about six years. I started in resource development and then I ended up as a Buncombe County Outreach Coordinator. And so I got to, you know, I had over a hundred pantries and um, kitchens that were my clients. And some of that was also um, with the county doing outreach to different housing projects and just learning more and more about black issues from my black friends in those communities and just seeing it from a completely different perspective as a white woman. You know, I thought I was pretty informed and educated and things like that, but just living and knowing the community and the things that they're dealing with on a daily basis is different. And so, um, and then even, I am sorry to say within the, you know, the food system that I was working in, I could see disparities and it isn't necessarily that everybody in the line was wanting to be racist or something like that, but, um, Systemic racism happens. It's embedded in a lot of our um, a lot of our systems, even our charitable systems. And uh, I I really grew to feel kind of resentful about it because I just saw a lot of certain religions and white established churches getting control of a lot of food, and it bothered me a lot. And I um, tried to work with that from inside that system until finally I just decided that model wasn't really something I wanted to work with. And so since that time, uh, and, and during that time, I would say I was pushed back from inside of Mana Food Bank. I was trying to push um, a philosophy that wasn't about um, helping the poor kind of thing. It was more about listening to communities and seeing where they're at and the, and the issues that they were dealing with and then not making barriers for simple food, you know just feeding, just getting fed. And there is no human that doesn't deserve to be fed. And so whenever you can see one, you know, some people in need getting lots of food and other people in need scrapping over food, it, it's upsetting. It, it, it hits you at a visceral level. And um, I got more involved. And then some of my uh, other community, I was involved in a church and other community organizations. And got involved in some racial equity work. And even as I got involved in that, I blundered along with a lot of other white people trying to do it right and did it wrong several times. And so would have to go back and make amends and apologies and say, yeah, we didn't know what we were doing and we need to listen more and um, hand over more power. And so that's, I don't know if I'm talking too long right now, but um, that's kind of my background. And as I saw, I was so thrilled when the reparations got passed, Keith Young, I just think he's awesome for authoring this and pushing it into the forefront. And I know 
city of Asheville gets a lot of guff and, and naysayers, but I think this is awesome and you just have to try. You just have to start and you are gonna make the mistakes. We are gonna make mistakes, whether we're directly involved or supporting it. And we just have to keep listening to the people that have been harmed and keep going forward. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay, anyone have any questions? Thanks, Amy, uh, for being here. The one thing I, I just found really alarming is when you said that the system, systemic racism that actually existed in charitable organizations, that to me, uh, I can't tell you the impact that it had when I, uh, could you elaborate on that a little bit more? Well, um, I think that our charitable systems have a lot of gatekeeping going on. And so the people, you know, I, I have my master's in public affairs from Western. And one of the things that we learned there is the, the, the bureaucracy has a lot of power. I mean, whether or not you have a title like a mayor or a governor or something like that, the reality is the person on the receiving end, like if someone needs help or you know there's help, there's people interfacing with those folks that need help. And those people interfacing have an awful lot of power. So what you can get is a front line of, I'm sorry to say, maybe some older church basement ladies is a very typical thing in the food banking system that get to decide what kind of food you deserve and how much. Now, there are some rules. So if you're involved in a federal TFAP food distribution system, there are some very strict rules that you cannot, it's not up to them, but it still is up to them to enforce those rules. And so what you can end up with is having, let's say a church body in this area, there's an awful lot of Baptist churches that are doing an awful lot of community work, but that means that someone might need to be in favor with that church body in order to get the best deal. And in those kind of systems, that's how it works, unfortunately. And as much as MANA or anybody else might try to help or um, enforce other rules, there are people up and down the system from the ground up to the national office that feel very differently about who gets to decide who gets what and how. So they may say, you need a social security number. They may say, let me check your this and that. They don't just say, oh, you're a human being that needs some food right now for your family. Let me give it to you. Thank you for all that information and insight, Amy. I think the, um, the lived experience needs is a wealth of information. But I'm wondering, how does that translate into your service on the Reparations Commission? And how does that information translate to your interest in housing? Okay. Um, so... My interest in the Reparations Commission, honestly, when I first heard it, I was like, well, I know there's a ton of smart people of color in this town and black folks in this town, and I want to leave it to them to decide. And then I saw that you all had another round of asking for applications. And then I saw some people, you know, giving guff saying like, oh, nobody wants to sign up. And I'm like, you know, that's not true at all. I know people are busy. Not everybody has time for this or whatever reason. And I just, I was seeing people kind of trashing it. I was like, oh, that's not not on my watch. I'm going to try and step up and do my part. And so I'm happy to give this position, allow everybody that want, you know, any person of color that wants to be on reparations commission already has a, a more experience than I do. They have more lived experience than I do. And I recognize that. And my wish would be that Black Ashevillians get to make up this commission, but that might not be possible. And so, you know, I can use my formal education to research. I might be able to research other towns or other policy to see how we could apply that. I might be able to do some interviews. Um, housing is near and dear to my heart because I am struggling with housing right now in this town. I am a renter. I am a single mom. I am feeling the pressure. I might have to move out of town. Um, so I know what that's like. And for me, it's it's devastating. I might have to move away from my children. And here I am, you know, a middle-aged white woman that this is the first time something like that devastating has ever happened to me. And it helps me understand a little better what's already been happening to people of color for decades and decades and over a century, you know? And so um, that's how I'm connected to housing. I also know if some of those black families still had those houses around Charlotte Street, they'd 
they'd be set right now. They'd be set. If they wanted to sell that property or sell that house, they would be maybe a millionaire, you know? And so I just see that they gave up a house for, you know, progress, but they didn't see their community progress. Other people got to benefit from that progress, but they did not. Um, does that answer your question or is there some piece I should Thank you for that. Thank fill you. in. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've reached our 10 minutes, so we're going to um, move on to the next candidate. But thank you very much for joining us here today. OK, thank you. All right, we're going to now interview Chantel Simpson. And um, if you would please just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in serving on the Reparations Commission. Yes, I can. Hello, everyone. Can you all see me and hear me? We can hear you, but we can't see you. I know it's odd. I, I think um, you might need to switch your camera up here. Yeah. If you, if maybe you have more. Oh, there you go. There you are. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Chantel Simpson. Thank you for the time today. Um, I am the Chief Executive Officer of Appalachian Mountain Community Health Centers. I'm new here to Asheville. Um, been here for about six months, actually, from Louisville, Kentucky. So thank you for allowing me the opportunity to interview today. Okay, go, and go ahead and tell us just um, a little bit about why you're interested in serving on the commission. Sure, well, you know, I'm new to Asheville and at first I had apprehensions because I thought, well, maybe this should be a position that someone who's been born and raised here should, should participate in. However, one of the things that I noticed when I first relocated to um, Asheville from Louisville, Kentucky was that the diversity, um, there doesn't appear to be much diversity. However, the citizens of Asheville were very nice and kind and warm and welcoming. Um, and I took it upon myself to do a tour of the city just to look at some of the, the housing projects, as, as we would call them back in Louisville, but the housing authority communities that are here in Asheville, just to kind of learn a little bit. And in my tour, I had the opportunity to speak to some of the residents of um, some of the area housing apartments and just their communication. Um, I asked them some of the things that they like to do in town and just their communication was very um, poor eye contact, looking down at the ground, told me that they like to stay pretty much separated and stay to their end of town. And that really sparked an interest to me to better understand some of the dynamics um, of Asheville, knowing that you all are a pretty liberal city, actually, that's really warm and welcoming of, of, of diversity. And when I learned about the um, agreement that the city made to for reparations, I was I was surprised. It was like the first city that I've ever heard to do that. And so I thought, well, this is a great opportunity for me to apply and see what skill sets and experiences I have to lend to to lend to the cause. Can I ask you, you, you put on your application that you, you would put education as your number one area for um, your impact area and health is number two, but you look like you have a really strong background in health. No, that please excuse me. That should have been the other way around. No, I will definitely help out in education if selected. However, <laughs> my strong points will be healthcare. I've been in healthcare for the past 20 years. I'm a registered nurse by trade. Yeah. Excuse hey, Chantel, how are you? I'm doing great. Hi. And a lot of ongoing reparations conversations, I heard the saying, Black health is Black wealth, and Black wealth leads to Black health. And I want to read you something and get your thoughts on it. Okay? Hold on for a moment. Sure. Okay. It says that through closing the racial wealth gap, reparations will also improve health outcomes. Health and wealth work bi-directionally as two of the greatest wealth race disparities in the United States. Poverty drives poor health, which in turn impedes wealth accumulation. I want to get your thoughts on that statement. Yeah, I totally agree. And not only can I, I'm, I'm in um, 
my history, I come from a very humble beginnings, right? So we didn't go to the doctor and we didn't go to the dentist or any of those things coming up. And it's not because we didn't find it important. It was that when you are growing up in poverty, you are competing against uh, the things that are necessary just to be alive every day, you know, uh, food just to eat for that day, shelter at least just for that day. So the last thing you're thinking about is, did I get my physical this year? Do I have my vaccines? And so um, as I watch people in my family and um, the patients that I care for, because I've always worked at a federally qualified community health center, which is a very vulnerable population, I, I see the struggle with trying to uh, become healthier and making time for understanding what it, what it means to be a healthier person. Um, for example, you know, just today, my mom called me and, and she's on aspirin and, um, she doesn't understand how to take that aspirin every day, but she also doesn't feel like she has a right to ask her doctor for instructions because I feel like African-American people due to systemic racism have, um, have not been taught to be owners of their, of their health and well-being. You know, they still put it in other people's hands because other people have controlled the distribution of, of health resources for so long. And so I definitely agree with that with that saying. Uh, I think by improving the health of Asheville residents, we're definitely going to improve their whole life. You know, they feel better, they're prouder, um, and they can go out and contribute back to society. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, yeah. Sure, I'll throw it in. I'll I wasn't because I love Shanika's question so much. So there's a book, I know, apparently I read a lot, called Cast. It's by Isabel Wilkerson. Okay. And it discusses how race really in our country and in, and in India is the basis for caste, not as it is in Europe, right? Mm -hmm. And one thing that was really surprising to me was the discussion that revealed essentially thinking of racism or race as a social determinant of health. So in this book, it points out that unlike other cohorts, Black folks actually, as wealth increases to a certain point, um, once we get to a mid-level, our health outcomes actually decrease. And the thought behind that is because once we get to a certain level of education, we're more likely to work in environments and racism smacks us in the face at the workplace. In your experience as a nurse, have you encountered that, um, that to be the case? And what suggestions do you have to improve that trend? Well, that is an excellent question. I would have to agree with that. I'm actually working on my doctorates right now, and my thesis is uh, dissertation will be on African American women in leadership. And one of the components of that is looking at the mental health stress. So I think the higher, more education we get, the higher positions we get, the the worse our mental health can become. I mean, when I look at myself, for example, I'm one of Maybe we have five African-American people that work within this organization. And in pretty much every meeting that I'm in, I'm typically the only black person, let alone maybe one of few women. And so it, you're actually putting on, you feel like you're having to put on a mask all day and, 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 and react a certain way. But I think what's helpful to that is a book that I've read called Knowledge, of the, Knowledge in the Blood. And um, it talks a lot about... Um, the uh, apartheid in Africa is very great because it gives grace. To me, it is what Mandela, they talk a lot about Mandela and how he was able to be so successful is that he gave grace even in the face of systemic racism. So I think what helps me and what could help others is to realize that it's all, some of it is blatant racism, yes, but do we have people who are of a different race who are just given the best that they have, the knowledge that they were born with, to live in society, they're following what they were taught by their parents and their parents and parents and grandparents before then. So I think having grace and understanding and being willing to participate in conversations like this and commissions like this is a step that leads us in the right direction instead of um, just leaning just on the quick answer of they're just racist. And that helps me every day to understand that I'm interacting with human beings who have just the knowledge in their blood, what, what they were born with. Thank you. Thank you. Him, yep. 
Thank you so much for participating in this process. Um, I wanted to ask, what would it look like for the community and what would it look like for the city of Asheville to support you as a commissioner if you were appointed to this commission? Oh, wow, great. I would want, I think this will be new for me, of course. Um, so of course, having colleagues around me to help support and come up with plans and, and to move things forward. But as it relates just to the healthcare component, to have support and understanding that healthcare is crucial in putting dollars behind um, decreasing some of that offset um, for those underprivileged people who don't get the healthcare resources and working with people who have passion, who are not really doing this just because it might be the right thing to do, but also because they're very excited and passionate about it. And we can share ideas, make plans, go out there and make it happen come back to the meeting room when we need to, but just keep moving forward as one team is what's important to me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The healthcare leader, Chantel, um, who's not a native and, and doesn't have a long stint in Asheville, how would you work collaboratively with other folks in the healthcare industry of African-American descent or those who have healthcare interests? How would you work collaboratively with them if chosen as a leader and the voice on this commission? Well, I think I'm a pretty open person. And one of the biggest um, tasks that I've, that I've been tasked with since moving here is, unfortunately, my predecessor didn't really get along with a lot of people I'm learning in Asheville. And so as I'm meeting other healthcare leaders and state leaders, uh, county managers, I mean, we really just kind of rub people the wrong way all the way around. And so um, being new on the block, I appreciate the fact that they're giving me an opportunity. So I feel like just being my true authentic self, um, lending something to contribute, not just taking um, toward making Asheville better will, will be a great step. And, and I'm having a lot of practice with that right now. Literally six months I've been here, there's probably been a, one meeting a month. I had two last week where I learned about how we didn't we rub someone the wrong way. And uh, <laughs> they're giving me that that grace and that chance to create a new face. I'm a social butterfly. I was, I was a little nervous about applying for this because I didn't know if it would put a political stamp on my forehead. Like, are people happy about this? Are people not happy about this reparations? But then I thought, you know what? Go with your passion and be authentic and just move forward. And I think that's how the best relationships are built. So I applied. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for applying. Um, and also, uh, thank you for giving Antoinette a book right back at her. That was pretty good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Well, yeah. All right. We've got, uh, thank you very much for joining us. We've got one um, interview before we're going to take a break, folks. So we're going to, um, we're going to say hello to Marla West, who is joining us. And Marla, if you could just begin by telling us a little bit about yourself and why you'd like to serve on the Reparations Commission. Okay. Um, well, I have lived here for nine years now, and I've seen all the inequities, and I've seen the African-American population diminish, according to what I've read. And I think that my background... Well, my background is in health, actually, also, but um, I was a certified health education specialist, but mostly it was in rep women's reproductive rights. And I just think that I could be um, some fresh eyes on the commission and lend a voice. I'm retired right now, and I have the time and uh, lend voice and fresh eyes to looking at reparations in Asheville. Good. Anyone have any questions? Sure. As I look at your um, application, the impact area where that you listed as your top um, was criminal justice. Can you give us an idea of why you chose criminal justice as the um, impact area that most interested you, please? Well, I'm a member of the Innocence Project. Um, I just think there's so much inequity in the criminal justice system in this country and as evidenced by the highly disproportionate number of African Americans that are imprisoned. Um, I've actually been focusing more on looking at housing though, housing inequity 
since I applied and wrote that. Um, but, uh, Feel free to tell us about housing inequities then if you okay. prefer. Um, I just think that, you know, farmers have lost 90% of their land in the last 100 years, black farmers. Um, there's, I think Asheville needs to look at its, historically, look at its history of where they displaced black people and where they took housing and land and businesses from them and how they've been displaced. Um, I think that um, it's important to remember that less than one-tenth of the net worth of, uh, that, I'm sorry, that African-Americans have less than one-tenth of the net worth that white households have in this country, and that is due to mostly housing because of redlining and mortgage discrimination and um, homes being undervalued. And I think that that is uh, just ludicrous that um, I remember even thinking that when I first moved here nine years ago, I didn't see many African-American people in town and I didn't really understand thinking, you know, I moved from, um, Albuquerque, New Mexico, originally, and uh, to here, and nine years ago, and I just didn't understand. Thinking moving to the South, that I would see a lot more African American people present in the streets and the neighborhoods, and I didn't see that. And I saw that as um, I didn't understand it until I did a research and read about it. And um, there was another. Um, project also that I read about that Cory Booker and Ayanna Presley have been interested in, and I think they have introduced this uh, federally. It's called the American Cities Act. Um, and that is another thing that I think could work with reparations money, where they give um, $1,000 to a, at birth to a child and then deposit, I believe it's $2,000 annually dependent on income. And there's, um, it's an interest bearing account. And I, then the child gets it when they turn 18. So I think that that could go a long way toward with reparations money on giving that child something to, when they're, when they turn 18, they could either use it for education or housing. And, um, Okay, any other questions? No, but thank you for being here today, Marla. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. Okay. Okay, folks, we have um, we have a break uh, until 3.05. So just, I think, I think all you gotta do is just shut down your a mic and your camera and we'll just come right back. Okay, now we are uh, back. We are, um, the city council here is interviewing candidates for the reparations commission. And the next person we're going to interview is Kelsey Simmons. Welcome Ms. Simmons. And if you could please just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in serving on the reparations commission. Thank you, Mayor Manheimer. I am more than ecstatic to be here today. Um, my name is Kelsey Simmons. I am an Asheville native of the area. Um, I went to high school in Silsa and then I left for a few years to go to college in UNC Charlotte. Um, and I got a, my degree in political science. And so essentially, you know, I came back to Asheville and I ended up getting into the nonprofit space. And the nonprofit space really showed me the different you know, disparities are not that are not only in the world, but just within your own community as well, and the, the work that needs to be done in order to fix those disparities. And I think one of those biggest disparities is affordable housing and knowledge around even accessing housing, knowledge around the resources that are even out here in order to, you know, get to a different level when it comes to building generational wealth, when it comes to to building a better future for your children when it comes to building a better future for yourself. And so, you know, coming back to Asheville, you know, I never thought that I would, to be honest, because 
it's not a diverse place and there's not a lot of opportunity for youth, but I think the potential is there. And the reason why I think the potential is there because, you know, I was raised by my grandmother and my grandmother was born and raised here and she was a homeowner here. And, you know, there was a large community of black homeowners here in Asheville. And, you know, there was a large amount, a larger amount of black wealth here, you know, than I see you know, in the in the current times. And I think we, we can take the steps in order to make those generations of youth like me feel like, hey, I can keep that going. You know, hey, like, you know, and be able to navigate what that looks like. And so, you know, just learning from my grandmother and it, and unfortunately she's not here with us today. I, la- I lost her a month ago to COVID, um, but she really wanted me to be here today. And really all the things that I've learned from her about the rich history that, you know, Black people had in Asheville, I I think we can take steps to bring that back and also not do that, just that one thing, but also encourage other cities to do so as well. Um, And I think that's really why I want to be on the reparations committee, because I come from you know, people that were affected by decisions like urban renewal and things like that. My grandma worked in and out just to keep her house with the increasing property taxes and being a single mother and all of these things. So I know the trials and tribulations and my, my, and I myself am a realtor. So I see the housing prices going up and people being, being pushed out of the neighborhoods and the opportunities. And that's just really unfortunate to me. And what's also unfortunate is, you know, youth like myself that have grandparents that owned homes and things like that, um, just knowing the steps on how to keep that wealth in the family. Like, you know, you don't want to just end up losing a house just because you didn't know how to pay the property taxes or, you know, there was one mortgage payment that was missed. Like that's years of generational wealth you could have had. And so I want to be able to help navigate that process, help educate people on things like that. Um, because I think it's really important in building wealth, like 90% of the world's millionaires are in, you know, they invest in real estate. So I just think that's very possible in Asheville. And I want to be able to spread that knowledge and use my own personal experiences to do that and the knowledge that I've gained over the years. And so that's why I really want to be on the reparations committee. So I have a question and I guess I want you to help me brainstorm a little bit. You mentioned that you are um, in real estate and you want to also um, be part of the solution that involves, I don't know, property education. So um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, the last assessments that came through from the county disproportionately affected um, Black Mm -hmm. folks. Really what that means is maybe some of our homes were undervalued in the first place. On the other hand, that also means that there's actually been an increase in assets and Mm -hmm. in wealth. So, and I imagine the next time we come out with um, a comparison between white and blacks, the gap will close a little bit. Help me brainstorm on what opportunities or what educational opportunities we could bring forward to folks who have been disproportionately affected, but can we get them into a position economically so that their homes, which are more valuable now, can help them um, spread and pass along that generational wealth? So... You're exactly right about the property assessments because I was actually fortunate to purchase a home here in Asheville in August and I got the bill back. I was like, what is this? This is not what I thought it would be. So in that, and that is definitely, you know, going to affect a lot more people, you know, such as myself and disproportionately affect the black community. And I think one of the simplest ways to put it is just spreading knowledge about the resources that are already out there. Um, in order to help close that gap. Because what I've seen working in the nonprofit space is that there's a lot of, you know, grants or nonprofits already doing the work. It's just that nobody is, you know, pushing this information to, I would, I would say, the Black community specifically so they're aware of what's going on. You know what I mean? 
I do. Because what I was thinking, you know, if mine happened to go up or something, I would go, oh, I'm worth 50000 more. So I would try and figure out how I could leverage that with banking or with rental. And I don't believe that discussion has been held in our community. So just no. keep that in mind, how we can bridge that gap. Yes. And and that that gap can definitely be bridged. And there's a lot of different options that are out there in terms of rentals and keeping it in the family through a long-term rental or something like that. So I think just the longer you hold on to it is really what you want to do. And as long as you have that knowledge, as this is an asset and, you know, yeah, I could sell it tomorrow and make this amount, but if I hold on to it, then it's going to be a lot more in the long run. And I think that's the challenge as well when it comes to the Black community and home ownership, because, you know, if they don't even want to live in the area, what what makes you think they're just going to, you know, want to keep the house as well? So being able to keep that house might also, you know, build you that wealth and you might want to stay in the area just because of the wealth that it's bringing you. So, yeah. I like when you said keeping it in the family. Do you have any ideas on how to keep a real estate asset in the family when so many people of color are cost burdened? Yeah, so I think that they just need to know what other options are out there. And it's tricky with Asheville because we do have, you know, our regulations on Airbnbs. But I do think, like, we've seen how lucrative Airbnb has really been. And so, what, you know, if there was a way that, you know, we could push that more out into, you know, the Black community, like, hey, there's options to do short-term rentals or even corporate housing, because there's money in corporate housing as well, but showing them other options. Um, but it is hard to keep it in the family because if you have multiple siblings and some of them want to sell, some of them don't, some want to hold on to it, it does get difficult. But I think, you know, if you catch them before, you know, they're even thinking about selling or pro provide them other options in the meantime, then that might help them not do that, you know? Hi, Chelsea. Uh, Hi, Sandra. Thank, yeah, how are you? Good, how are you? And I do know that um, the thing is, I, I would say, one of would you say that one of your hardest challenges, like you said, in, in, in dealing in the Black community is a matter of trust? Mm -hmm. No. And so how would you go about developing that trust in the community? Because that's what's missing. Like you said earlier, there are a lot of programs out there, but they're not connecting. And mm -hmm. they're not connecting because there's not a trust relationship. And right. so what would you do to ensure that we kept that uh, trust thing going on so we can actually reach the people that need the help? What would right. you do? Well, trust is a big thing. And, you know, that is the thing out here in the community. Some some people might trust a, one nonprofit over the other, and that's why it's not connecting, or it could be any type of situation. But I think, you know, trust really comes down to, you know, either building that relationship, and it takes a while to build relationships, but if y'all kind of come from the same background, or if you can just show them the facts, sometimes people oh, no, are no. just... What can you do to actually can, that gap right. trust in the community and those nonprofits? What can you do to... So I would say just basically being a true, genuine advocate for my community, like that sounds like a very basic answer, I would say, but just really show the passion that I have and, you know, talk to these different nonprofits and convince them of why they need to work together or even just analyze where the gaps are and then be like, hey, these are where the gaps are. This is how we can all work together in order to close them. Because sometimes it's not even about the resources. Sometimes it's just certain gaps aren't being filled. So, you know, I would just be that, you know, consultant, perhaps, you know, to just come yeah, around and, yeah, yeah. yeah, and bring, bring that together, bring that conversation together. Yeah. Thank you, Elsie. Thank you, Sandra. So. Well, thank you. We, we are up on time. Um, I'm getting little messages here about <laughs> time from folks. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much for joining us here today.
Um, and we're going to move on to the next person we're interviewing, which is Veronica Casey. All right. Thank you all for your time. Have a great day. Thank you. Um, Ms. Casey, if you could just um, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in serving on the Reparations Commission. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Veronica Casey, and I am a native of Asheville, North Carolina, born and raised. Uh, I'm a graduate of Irwin High School and also uh, a graduate of AB Tech and UNC Asheville. Um, I am currently the coordinator of scholarships and donor relations uh, in the uh, college advancement uh, office here at AB Tech, where I oversee the scholarship process and work with current and potential donors, uh, as well as uh, faculty and staff. Um, and so, um, in a sense, I do consider myself an educator. Um, it, you know, it's my responsibility to make sure that our community and our students are aware of the resources available to them at AB Tech, uh, particularly uh, those students of color. Um, I think that um, when it comes to education, from the educational standpoint, um, when we talk about permanently closing gaps, um, whether it be the achievement gaps or between blacks and white students uh, in K through 12, or the equity gaps uh, in retention, uh, and completion rates uh, between blacks and whites uh, at the community college level. Um, you know, we know that um, the community colleges may have an open door policy uh, with open admissions, um, you know, but there's still equity gaps in retention and completion rates between black and white students. And so when students start a program and can't continue because of lack of funds to pay for the course, the course is, and don't qualify for any other type of aid, um, you know, that failure to pay means that the student can't enroll until the balance is paid, um, which in most cases, students opt not to return. So a lot of times, you know, we're, you know, we aren't talking 20 or $50, we're talking thousands of dollars or more. So this in turn could have a massive effect on, you know, the person's livelihood. So what I would like to see in, you know, possibly serving on um, the Community Reparations Committee is, you know, you know, as far as in terms of economic growth, um, you know, to restore the dignity of Blacks uh, by, you know, providing affordable housing uh, via ownership and bridging the education and um, an equity gap, you know, rebuilding communities by replacing Black residents, you know, restoring homeowners and, you know, Black businesses, particularly those, those startup businesses um, within the communities, um, you know, by educating them. Um, you know, increasing economic growth by, you know, providing spaces for black businesses to be especially, you know, easily accessible and seen, you know, um, and not only, you know, provide those businesses with, with monetary means, but with land and space to be seen, to be heard and to be valued, um, you know, and being intentional, you know, when it comes to inviting people to the table to actually participate. So, you know, again, allowing them to be seen, to be heard, and to be valued. So, you know, I'd like to see, you know, see us do away with, you know, all the many disparities within the, the Black community, you know, our community, um, you know, by restoring, you know, its identity, you know. Um, I know that, you know, with my experiences, um, you know, I have friends who I graduated with who have left the area and come back. And when they come back, you know, they ask them, you know, where are the black people? Where are the black businesses? You know, um, and so for me, you know, I want them to, you know, when they're coming back into the community, I want them, you know, to see these businesses, you know, um, and not ask that question. I want to the, them to be able to see them, to hear them. Uh, and to see their value. So, you know, I don't claim to know everything, but I do know enough to to want to know and to do more, especially when it comes to, um, you know, to our Black community um, and education. Uh, LaBronica, I'd like to ask you a question. When you came on earlier, you said something about the, the uh, education gap 
you know, that between the black and, and white or whatever. And then you mentioned the uh, financial and economic part. How much could that gap be brought closer if the economic factor was not there for the minority of black students? Hmm, that's a good question. So what, restate that question, I'm sorry. Okay, like you were talking about the educational gap you know, between the uh, black and white students as far right. as success. And then you mentioned the financial uh, economic part of it. And I was just saying, how much could we actually reduce that gap between uh, the students, actually the black and white students, if they didn't have a financial uh, component, if they were able to uh, supplement that financial part? Um. What I'm trying to figure out is with the reparations and actually providing funds to assist those, you know, certain percentage of students that wouldn't have made it, or wouldn't, you know, or drop out. What, what, how could we actually affect that uh, gap? You mean as far as through reparations? Funding, the funding. The funding. Um, well, I think a lot of the students on when when you look at the um, the community college level, a lot of the students don't have access to those particular funds. Um, so I think that providing them, you know, a lot of them have you know balances. They have balances that need to be paid. So I think that by providing uh, funds to pay those balances off, so that those students are able to, uh, you know, enroll in school um, and to continue on. Um, you know. Yeah, and I was just trying to gauge how much would that reduce the gap between the black and white achievement uh, in the school. I have, I can't, I can't. I, I was just, I was just, you know, because if that, <laughs> you know, because if, if that's what it is, if we could actually reduce it and show our, our more positive uh, 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 graduation rate or whatever, mm -hmm. then that would, to me, would be a very worthwhile fix. Right. I was just sort of wanting to know. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much for joining hey, us. Today. This is Kim. Oh, sorry. sorry, I didn't want to jump in front of anyone else's question, but um, thank you so much for participating in this process. Um, we do have, um, you know, education gaps and wealth gaps that are going to need to be addressed. But as you considered um, being that native of Asheville who went to school here, um, who's working with our students here, what would it look like for our community? And what would it look like for the city of Asheville to support you um, if you were appointed to this commission? Um, you mean as far as, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, no, it's fine. I was just thinking about it. It's such a, we're asking such a almost impossible task for a, such a small group of people to do. And I'm just so thankful that our neighbors are willing. So what does support look like if you're able to do it? Well, I mean, I, I think, I think it takes support from, you know, it takes a village. And so I think that, you know, being able to provide the resources, you know, not just monetarily, but just, you know, having people at the table that could provide the, you know, those resources uh, that would, you know, that would help. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank well, you. I, so. I, do, I do have a question. Um, Laura, you mentioned having experience working with local government. Can you give us an idea of what that work looked like? Yes. Yeah, so um, when I worked with county government, I was actually the certification coordinator with the Office of Minority Affairs, and I actually um, was the uh, was the li liaison between county government and um, and local businesses. Um, and so I. Um, help to to facilitate training for uh, for local women and minority-owned businesses and helping them to do business with city and county. 
Um, and I love that you have experience working with the community colleges because I think the community college can play a very integral role in helping us do more business development. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a vision for how to utilize our community colleges or our the Asheville Buncombe Community College to be specific? Well, I think when it comes to when it comes to businesses, I think that you know a lot of our minority businesses they need a lot of, of support. You know, and I think that, um, you know, having that partnership uh, with the city of Asheville and providing funds um, with, you know, possibly with the small business uh, center uh, in, in providing funds for those uh, minority business owners, um, particularly the startup businesses, um, I think would be would be wonderful, you know, to use those funds in partnerships with initiatives um, you know, where, you know, minority business owners are, are writing business plans and presenting their business plans. And, you know, so I think that would be a great partnership, um, with the city of Asheville and with these reparations, um, you know, to, to help those, those businesses. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank We're you. Gonna... All right. Okay, our next um, candidate is Tiffany Double I hope, Tiffany, I said your last, last name correctly. Um, if you could please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in serving on the commission. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for your time to be here today. Um, my interest in serving on the Reparation, Rep, Reparations Commission uh, is threefold. First, you know, I want to represent education regarding um, equal and fair opportunities for our students in access. And second, I want to represent as far as um, black women in community and just being able to bring my voice to a space that in most often times they're male dominated. And third, I just want to be able to represent history. So being intentional regarding what does tomorrow look like and how we can um, lean into that today. Hey, Tiffany, good afternoon and thanks so much for coming. You work with, at um, Asheville Middle School, right? I believe so. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience working there, um, particularly in the the throes of the pandemic, um, what worked and didn't work with the pods, and what lessons learned from the pods you would carry forward if you were able to do so. Thank you. That that is a loaded question, and I um, that's why I'll touch I on each aspect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and thank you for that. Um, so in regards to working at Asheville Middle School, I currently work through a strategic partner through Hood Huggers. So I'm working through a nonprofit. My past years, I spent 10 years at Asheville Middle School working through Asheville City Schools Foundation. Um, throughout that time, I, it was amazing to see and work with children of color, but all children together within the space and capacity in which you know I was involved and that was through after school. But the pandemic really just brought a lot of changes to our educational system, uh, just all across the country, specifically here in Asheville, you know, working as an after school director, but then working with teachers and connecting with parents, there was just such a great need for, for youth interaction and engagement. Before they were able to do any type of engagement, it was just a lot of people coming to the table. And eventually the piece started with at home learning. But the major factor that the pods brought up was making those connections through com community partners to see what parents in neighborhoods like housing neighborhoods or neighborhoods that is ravaged with poverty, those parents were in dire need of some type of in-person engagement. And it was just amazing to see that, um, you know, the pods, they were created by a group of Black-led organizations, our Black leaders, and staff working with actual city schools to come together to create a space where children could see other children that look like them, 
during a, a hard time, but also work with adults um, that look like them. So for example, the school system invested that time and money to have the majority of staff of color working in the pods. So that was a success. And even just looking back at just some of the data and the um, news reports, it was even after the first week when the pod started, which was in August of 20, um, 2020, 2019, excuse me, 2020, to be correct. Those, um, those students, the children there, well, for one, there wasn't, you know, no reports of bullying, so that's a plus. But the children in one month started showing significant difference um, just within wanting to be there, taking ownership. Um, the staff, which were like mentor leaders, they um, experienced and showed more confidence in their role. So it, it was just a great experience to start off with. But of course, there were some challenges and, and the challenges were for one, capacity. So how could we, or how could they, and I'm sorry for the background, I'm at Grind, I usually work here um, just in this space and I didn't realize they were closed. So. It's fine. But yeah, um, so just fast forward and keeping on pace. So in the beginning, the pods had a lofty goal, right, to service about 200 students with 23 different sites. So the capacity wasn't there for staff. Another great incentive came up through that. So now it was the investment in people of color to now skill them up. So I, I remember um, a very good friend of mine who she started, she's directing at Eddington now. She's not an Asheville native. She's a woman of color that came through knowing the, um, I would say key players through Asheville Parent Leadership Program. And she started that in 2018. And now 2022, she's um, managing a space at Eddington. Okay, thank you. This is Tiffany. This, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Oh, so Tiffany, following up on what you just said, um, around, um, you know, there's been conversation at ACS about trying to eliminate the desegregation order. Based on your um, experience with the pods, et cetera, are you supportive of that initiative or, or not? And can you just, I mean, I just wondered if that would be something that um, would be something that maybe the Reparations Commission would uh, pick up, just whether or not they should, ACS and the city should support that kind of initiative or to um, just keep the, the desegregation order in place? So that's a great question. And to be, to be totally honest, at this time, I'm just working with some key stakeholders that's a part of my team to kind of unpack what this is all about because it seems like it's an age-old um, policy that's now coming up to be reviewed. And I have mixed mixed feelings pertaining to that that I would love to kind of share uh, later. Just a little more work. Yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a complicated issue and um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand it, but I was just thinking that, you know, with your experience with the pods, maybe you got a little more insight with that, but um, to be, to be, um, right. Tiffany, this is Kim. Um, I'm curious how, um, in your opinion, um, why does the wealth gap currently exist in Black Asheville, and what would it look like for the city or for the community to support you in your work in addressing that on the Reparations Commission? These are all great questions, and I do appreciate it. For me, when I think of the wealth gap, it's not just Asheville, but it's more than that. It's just, um, it's over time resource hoarding. And all families need wealth and to be able to be economically secure and just to be able to create opportunities for the, for the next generation. And looking at Asheville, and even I'm originally from New York and understanding the, the ravages of 
uh, urban renewal that took place there, we don't have anything to fall back on. And so it's sad to say how Asheville lost a lot of land and it was based on policies that really was designed strategically to uphold one group of people along with oppressing another group at the same time. Um, generational wealth or the gap still exists because even now I see that I'm struggling right now to purchase a home. And it's not because I'm not working hard on my credit, but it's even more so me going through an internal aspect of being able to own and, and um, own a home and have my own land and things like that. But when I look at generational wealth and the gap, I realize that my dad, he inherited a house that my grandmother did, but that isn't going to pass down to me. And so when we see certain families that have more than or really a lot, we have to understand, or for myself, I understand that having that lot is more than just because their family is wealthy, but it's because that wealth has been passed down. And in order to move forward, like some resources that I believe is necessary is to be able to bring, again, like key holders, key players to the table that really, whether they've been gatekeeping or whether they feel like they, they have a stake in it, bring them to the table with some full, for example, like Asheville Black Demands, having individuals hear that and really following through. So making sure that we kind of we're on top of it. So we're paying attention to what's necessary and we're paying attention to the outcomes. And we're also paying attention to the promises to make sure that they're fulfilled. I am, uh, again, I apologize for the background noise. No problem, we could hear you really well. It's kind of a, kind of a nice, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was felt live. Um, we really appreciate you joining us here today, and um, we will uh, be moving on to our next candidate that we're going to interview, and that is Dewana Little. Thank you um, for your time. Thank you. And Dewana, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in serving on the Reparations Commission. Um, hi. Hold on one second. I was trying to get my camera to cut on. Um, well, um, I'm interested in serving on the Reparations Commission because I am a fourth generation native of Asheville and I have felt and seen definitely the impacts of, um, of urban renewal on the community, especially within my family. And so I really try, like I want to present my skills and my talents and be an asset to this commission as it moves forward. And so I really want to be a part of the process. You mentioned the personal impact of urban renewal. I would love for you to expand on that. Where did you live? Where, what was taken? Anything you want to add? And so my grand, my great grandparents, um, lived here and they own several houses um, across the community. They actually were pretty well off um, initially. And so um, the impacts of urban renewal on them that I got to, got to hear about and learn about from their stories is them losing access to their land and losing houses in the South Side area and how most of my family who once owned homes we're now in public housing developments, um, at least three generations of my family. And so it's crazy because I think about me and, and everybody one day, like what made me different? And it, it was nothing that made me different. I just had the focus, you know what I mean? I had the focus and the drive and I got the opportunity to leave Asheville to really develop myself and, and have opportunities that other people I wouldn't have had if I stayed. And that's the that like that's the harsh reality. Um leaving Asheville opened up doors for me and opened up opportunities for me and skills that I wouldn't have been able to access living here. 
And so I was able to go away and gain skills and come back and sow that into my community. And so that's and help my family to overcome some of their barriers to be able to be in position, better positions now. Hi, Dewana, this is Sage. Thank you for applying. It's nice to see you. Um, you play a key role in the YMI and that area of downtown. And I'm curious, and you've listed economic development as your, you know, meter of the five buckets we're looking into. And I'm curious what you think um, via the reparations process that could mean for economic development or particularly the block area where you're already involved or if you have any ideas around that that you could share. Yeah, I, it, it means the presence of black businesses. Uh, one thing is like, I grew up seeing the block and the participating in programs at the YMI and to see all the black business, I got that opportunity. And now I'm a parent and my kids don't have access to that. And it's it's hard to find black business, thriving black businesses in downtown. Me and my family and friends used to walk through downtown all the time as a kid and, and had safe space. The block was our safe space. That's the reality. It was a space where we knew we could go and see people that look like us for whatever good or bad reason, you know what I mean? And be a part of our community. You know what I mean? It was a place where we came together. It wasn't about just goon babe coming to the block. We like it was almost every weekend. You know what I mean? We were on the block um experiencing black life and and seeing thriving black businesses. And so for me, economic development is the, the creation of spaces for black businesses to be visible. Not in the basement, not in in the back offices, but visibly on the streets where you can walk down at walk down any street in downtown Asheville. It's not limited to the block in my vision. It's limited to any street and recognize black businesses and see a black presence that is almost non-existent. You know what I mean? And I like the way the block is growing. And I like that I am in a space where I am able to look across the street and see thriving black businesses. And you know what I mean? But at the same time, it shouldn't just be on the block. It should be across Asheville as a whole. Thank you. And I've already done in that area. Dewana, this is Shaniga. Um, clearly you have um, a lot of lived experience you have great work experience and leadership experience. Um, and I know you to be um, a solution focused lady. Um, you have a lot of programs already in the pipeline through the YMI and other initiatives that you have. One in particular is the um, how you're seeding the community with black real estate agents. Do you have any other businesses, any other programs like that um, which you can see on a larger frame, like a city, county level? I think um, definitely the real estate apprenticeship program is super big um, and it's super important. You know what I mean? And we developed that program because we've seen the lack of Black people in that area when it came to access and home ownership or looking into the purchase of property or business. And so we really wanted to bring that opportunity. Then it was so many people who had an interest in that field that just could not afford to be a part of that. And so when I think about other programs that we have, um, we have the business incubation program that we, we have been doing. We have six businesses um, through our business incubation program that have been alive and thrive through 2020 <laughs> and still functioning um and they're black businesses um also we have um i have in my other hat um a positive changes program um and so through positive changes we are seeing our youth with the knowledge and the experience to be able to determine and define their future. And, and as we tell them all the time, it's not about your social economical status right now. It's about what you want to be and how you can tip the scales. What does it take to get where you're trying to go? And so we take them across the country um, to different schools, not promoting one school over the other, but helping them to see themselves in different environments. And this summer we took 26 um, high school students students um, who would not have otherwise had the opportunity to afford that type of experience. And it's always a seven, a seven night, eight day trip. Um, but they get to also 
work on projects on if you could run your own country, what would that look like? And if you could build your own school, what would that look like? And then we take that back to the schools and different people to to really try to support their vision and action. You know what I mean? Put their vision and action based on the vision of our kids because they are our future. And so we're always finding ways to invest and I'm always looking for ways to invest and really support the initiatives of my community and, and showing people other options. And so that would be a program that I think would be something that is scalable because not only do we do that through that program, we also support youth and exploring their business and future career paths as well as um, internships and apprenticeships. Could you talk about your role at self-help and how that experience helped you develop programs? One particular one particular program I'm thinking of is, is your down payment assistance program. Could you talk more about that? I kind of see scale in that program. Oh, yes. I love the down payment assistance program. Um, I actually proposed the Black Economic Solvency Program to self-help to, because we self-help's um, mission is equity economic opportunity for all. And so I felt like we were met, it was a gap because as we looked at our lending and our resources, the percentage of Black people that was actually being able to access it was very low. And so I, I proposed that because home ownership is one of the biggest wealth drivers in history and currently. And so through home ownership, people have been able to leverage that for college funds and medical things that come up or whatever they need to leverage it from to start businesses and different things like that. And it has been one of the most in intergenerational wealth drivers um, historically and currently. Land is the one thing that doesn't lose value. And so I always want to promote the access to people being able to afford that. And through our down payment assistance program, we have been definitely able to get people of color into homes and home ownership. I'm actually closing today on the house uh, with one of our participants. And so I'm excited about all the opportunity and helping people to reach that goal because through that program, we also work with them on filling those gaps of how do I get my finances from here to there? How do I save? How do I, that financial management um, capabilities and supporting them in that and credit building as well. This is Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I want to thank you so very much for sharing your story about getting away from here and then being able to learn and come back and share that with the community uh, because that resonates with me. And I, I greatly appreciate all the work and hard work you've done there at the YMI and the, the programs that you've put in place that have benefited the community tremendously. And, uh, and I thank you so very much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dewana, for being with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, and we've got one more interview before we take another break, and that is Jackie Latek. And Jackie, I'm looking around. I think you've joined us. If you would just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you'd like to serve on the commission. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jackie Latek with the Spark Foundation. And honestly, I had not intended to um, apply for this committee. I, I wasn't sure that I really um, was or would be the right fit. Um, I'm really talking myself up here. But uh, someone I trust um, and I consider a mentor reached out to me um, to encourage me to apply because of the experience that I have within my agency and the criminal justice services that we provide. So we have worked with um, people returning from incarceration. We work with communities currently um, that are experiencing high rates of violence, uh, work with families involved with social services. And, um, you know, I learn a lot from the people that we serve about their challenges. Um, I hear from my coworkers who do the direct services uh, that share those challenges with me. And so if my knowledge on this topic can be useful to the committee, then I commit to being a, a full participant, an active listener, um, and a transparent communicator. So that's why I'm here today. So Jackie, when I look at your application, I would have thought your um, first choice for the impact area would have been somewhere around healthcare, mm -hmm. but you listed criminal justice is one, 
Number two was economic development. So can you tell me why you chose those two and in that order and why not health related? You know, honestly, all of all of them, they, there's so much intersection with all of them. Um, the criminal justice side, I, I think, um, as I was saying, that there's really um, a lot of knowledge that I have learned just through those services, and that that felt like that felt like the right fit. And even in some of the directions we're continuing to go in the community um, on that side of things. Um, continuing to do the research and understand those challenges and potential solutions. So criminal justice felt um, felt like the initial good fit. I mean, healthcare, it, it also is. We provide services um, in the mental health world. We work with families uh, involved with social services and do some family systems work uh, with families who are um, separated, kids going into foster care or residential care and try to reunite them and bring them back. A lot of those families experiencing um, substance abuse. So we have a recovery component as well. So I do certainly see healthcare as, as another um, pocket of work that, that we're into. I think economic development, one of the reasons that that hits home, when I look at um, in my career of all of the work that I have done with children and families, and, and seeing the disparities experienced, there is this common factor for, for most of those people, and it is that they're all living in poverty. So there's, there's this connection with all of them, and then they end up in all of these different systems, and the systems show us all of these disparities. So I feel like that's an area that we really want to be able to focus on as a community. If we're really going to make a difference, that economic piece is so very critical. Um, so I think that's probably, that's really why I, I selected that as a second one. It's just sort of what I believe is such an important factor if we're really going to make a difference. Thanks. Um, expungement clinics, how successful are they working in Asheville? And how much does it cost? What's what's the what's the hustle? What's the hassle behind getting your record expunged? Because that's directly connected, in my opinion, directly connected to um, economic mobility. Mm -hmm. So you know that whole piece for whether it's somebody who's currently returning from incarceration or maybe they've got charges in their past. Um, and they just believe that those things on their record are going to prevent them from getting a job, which that is very accurate and true. Um, you can go through this process of expungement. Now, there's going to be limitations on what can be expunged. Um, but here's the, here's the thing that our world today makes us very difficult. So we've got this online world that we have access to all this information, right? And so if I am convicted, it's like, boom, all my conviction goes out into the, the internet world, right? Um, so it's out there in all these different sites uh, where anybody can access that information. Now I can go get an expungement, but my expungement does not go out to all of those sources that already have my information that I've had that conviction. So it can be really challenging. You go through that process and you believe that that has now been taken care of for you. And then you go apply for a job and somewhere in your process, oh no, actually that still is coming up for you because some system out there still has that listed. So it is it is still a challenge. So it's not, it's not a foolproof system. I think we have in Asheville with uh, the Inclusive Hiring Partners Project. I mean, that's been a great connection with companies that need um, people and want to hire people at living wages, um, connecting them with individuals who are hard to employ, whether it is that criminal background, whether it is something else. So we've had some movement in this town with being able to employ people who have those backgrounds. Um, that's now not sort of the major barrier for somebody returning from incarceration. Um, but you certainly feel like when you're working with those individuals, nobody really wants you to reenter society because the barriers are so tremendous. You come out and you, know, you probably don't have a driver's license you can't get your driver's license until you pay off your court fees, but you can't pay off your court fees until you get a job, but you can't get a job because you don't have a driver's license. So it's that round and around just about in every area you look. Um, so there's, there's still tremendous challenges that have to be overcome here. Thank you.
Any other questions? Um, this is Kim. Of, oh, sorry. Go, Kim. Go ahead, Shanika. You've been a part of the um, Safety and Justice Challenge. Um, I'm just wondering, um, what are we not doing that you would like to lift in this space? Or what, what should we be doing more of in order to address some criminal justice issues, reentry issues, um, and just safety overall? So, man, there's so much in there. Um, one of the things that we're looking at that I think our community really needs is more direct um, intervention for those who are committing the violence or who are most at risk of, of violence being committed against them. And there are programs that we are looking at and that's, that is one piece of the puzzle, more direct intervention with those individuals. You know, when we look at what, what are the root causes um, of violence, I mean, that's where all of our community programming, we need to beef up all of that community programming um, to address the poverty, to address the disparities in education, um, you know, all the opportunities, the feelings of hopelessness. I mean, there, there, is, there is so much of that as well when you've been living in oppression that you don't believe you deserve the job that my folks tell you that you can actually get. I can teach you how to fill out an application but if you don't have the hope and the belief that you can actually get that job, because frankly, life has taught you, you've never deserved that anyway, you can't move past to that next step. So there's, there's this broad, we've got to understand human nature. We have to understand how to help people recover um, emotionally from what they've experienced and give them the skills. And then we have to address the individuals who are already down the road of committing that violence and find the ways to stop that violence from happening because that's just perpetuating in our community and then keeping our kids going down that same road. Kim, did you have a question? Jackie, could you expand on um, what kind of models for direct um, intervention with individuals looks like? So there, there are several models that we've looked at. One is called Cure Violence, started in Chicago in early 2000. There's one that started in North Carolina, it's called CHASM. So those are the two we're looking at. They um, use a public health model approach. So seeing violence similar to a virus, which we understand spreads really quickly. Um, so using what they would call community health workers, those are trusted individuals in the community, people who already are from those communities, live there, have the relationships um, to do mediation um, of conflict, to respond when a violent event has occurred, um, and to begin to change um, sort of that community piece about this is the this is the direction that we want to be able to go in with this is we want to change um, the idea that violence is the answer for that. So is using individuals in the community to have those conversations with those that are committing the violence. Thank you. Jackie, thank you for being here today and, and thank your friend for encouraging you to apply. I appreciate the perspective you brought just even to this interview process. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, folks, we're going to take a, another break. We have a 10 minute break when we're behind schedule, but um, how, how about um, uh, 4.15? And then we'll, we have five more after the break. Thank you. Okay, welcome back to the final portion of our candidate interview for the Reparations Commission for the City of Asheville. Um, we have five candidates remaining this afternoon that we are going to be interviewing um, with appointments to be made at the upcoming City Council meeting on February 22nd. And welcome to Tamari Macon, our next um, candidate that we're interviewing. Hello. Um, if you could just begin by telling us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in serving on the Reparations Commission. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. Appreciate y'all's time. And yeah, you're in the home stretch. So hopefully you have energy for this last round. Um, so again, my name is Tamari Macon, and I am a faculty member through UNC Chapel Hill Gilling School of Global Public Health, and I am based here in Asheville. I have the pleasure of teaching in the Master of Public Health program. 
So growing that workforce in our region of Western North Carolina. I've been in Asheville for four and a half years and have had the opportunity to meet and work with lots of people. Um, I began working with Homeward Bound. And so um, my role was in the permanent supportive housing role and got to learn more about the landscape of housing and, um, and people who are unhoused. And um, before that, my training is in public health, obviously, as well as in education psychology and in um, um, a master's in psychology. And I feel that I am able to see things from a systems view, which is would be really important in this work, and um, also have some experience with um, several of the impact areas, which are named um, in the resolution and in the application. So I feel like I am able to bring a perspective and able to ask incisive questions. That's one of my favorite things to do and one of the things my colleagues know that I tend to do. And um, one aspect of that I think is really ensuring that we're examining not only the individual level, but also structures and systems level and um, ensuring that solutions are really reparative and not just um, short term or even potentially harmful. Um, I guess one other piece I'll say is that it's really important to me that there is strong community engagement in this work and that the reparations solutions that are developed are um, involve engagement of black community and are accountable to the black community in Asheville. And that means every black person in Asheville um, and Buckham County. And um, I think I'm able to have both uh, an academic research lens and also that um, desire to be accountable to um, people I'd represent. Thank you. So, so good to see you, Dr. Macon. Haven't seen you in person in at least two years, right? Yes. Yeah, so, as I mentioned to Dr. Mullen earlier, based on your application and just what I know of you on a personal um, basis, I think, quite frankly, you could fit within any of the impact areas. So, I won't ask you which one um, you prefer. I want to home in on something that is probably potentially too specific, but I think you would be the person to ask this. So keeping in mind um, uh, Professor Darty and Mullen's framework for what reparations, what that process should entail, what is it specific to your background that would allow you to do just that in um, a framework that would be fitting specifically for Asheville? Thank you for that question. Um, if I'm understanding you correctly, I'm thinking about um, how the doctors Mullen and Darity talk about the ARC framework of acknowledgement. Um, of course, I'm going to forget the R. Um, Uh, redress and closure, you know, you know it. Thank you, redress and closure. Of course, only our word I can think about is reparations right now. Um, I think the point I want to make here is um, I actually just heard them speak around the redress part and how there is certainly a financial part, and that's what they emphasize and talk about in terms of a national program of reparations. And there's um, a more relational, emotional healing component that they believe like would be harder to determine because it's based on what the injured group would feel would constitute um, a sufficient effort to indicate that an apology or um, an apology would be accepted. And so I think actually both are really important and that speaks to the notion of um, what that looks like will be very specific to particular communities. So obviously people refer to the South African process and truth and reconciliation, how that was specific to that community and what was useful in that context. And it's going to look different in different contexts. I think about reparations as obviously being about money and land and that being a piece of it. And it's also beyond money and land in terms of allowing each of us to be healed and whole in a way that can only happen through um, acknowledgement and redress. And I appreciate that they name that these things have to come before there's closure or um, they also talk about conciliation um, as opposed to reconciliation, but bringing people together. And I think 
that um, if the redress is done in a way that is according to the, the communities that have been harmed and what is acceptable to them in terms of both a repayment or um, um, redress of specific harms in a financial and material way, there's also a piece that is relational and um, and has to do with right relationship with each other, which to me is a part of justice. Thank you. Any other questions? I thought someone would jump in, but. Dr. Megan, this is Kim. Thank you so much for um, the opportunity to share this space with you by applying for this process. I wonder um, if you could speak to um, what it looks like to have support from the community and what it looks like to have support from the city of Asheville um, if you were to be appointed to the Reparations Commission. Kim, I think I understand what you're asking, but if you wouldn't mind maybe saying it a slightly different way to make sure I'm capturing. Sure, so we're asking our neighbors to participate in this um, important work. And as we ask for that, um, what would it look like for us to support you able to do it? Thank you. I think it requires a lot of us doing it and a lot of people who already have relationships with community members um, building on that. Um, I certainly am proud to work with different organizations, different black led organizations and have some relationships with individuals and, and groups um, in this area. And I think um, about the process in Providence, for example, in which every commission member and their um, specific example was connected to, in that case, at least 10 other community members that they would constantly be in communication with before and after meetings, getting their input, keeping them up to date about the process. So that's one small way that maybe each member of the commission could be connected to individual individuals or group, groups. And obviously there are more um, black people in Asheville and people in general um, who uh, we'd want to keep informed of the process. So I think you know, connecting with the city's engagement office and other groups that are already on the ground, connecting with people would be important. Um, and I think it's useful that Dr. Mullen and others on this um, being interviewed have connections with community already. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Okay. Hi. <laughs> okay. I'd like to ask you from your, uh, like you have a degree in psychology, and I would just like to see your perspective, uh, hear your perspective on the impact, the mental impact uh, that has, and the damage that's been done uh, to the community, and how would you address or come up with something that could actually sort of help uh, remediate that? to some degree, I mean, you can't eliminate it, <laughs> okay. Yeah, such an important aspect, thank you. It, it's um, heart-wrenching to attempt to calculate. And I think there's, you know, unending forms of trauma and experiences and aggressions and structural violence that people have experienced um, and generationally, intergenerationally. And um, I think that our trauma shows up in our behaviors and in, in various ways. And I'm aware of um, different emergent groups of people who are in the mental health and behavior and well, behavioral health space. And that can look like formal and to informal forms of support. So I'm thinking about um, ways to support our, our mental health that are not only clinical, um, knowing that for some people, those resources are useful for some people, maybe less so let alone having access to them. I think that, um, you know, one way that uh, another scholar has talked about this, about the, the trauma and the harms being really perpetual and unending, the, the reparations, the resolutions to counteract that also need to be perpetual and unending. And oh my gosh, I'm out of time. I'll say one last sentence that um, 
I, I, I hope that we bring to this process really creative solutions that are also potentially perpetual things like differential property taxes and access to no cost education and those sorts of things that are not just time limited programs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to um, move on to the next person, and that is Dwayne Richardson. And Mr. Richardson, if you're there, if you could just tell us a little bit. Hi, welcome. Thank if you, you could just me. tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested in serving on the Reparations Commission. Absolutely. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I will begin by saying I am recovering from COVID, and so you, I'm, I may be... Uh, stricken with a, a brief cough or two here, there, please bear with me. Having said that, uh, my interest in, in joining the Reparations Commission, as a, as a lifelong uh, resident, I was actually born in Los Angeles, but moved nearly immediately to North Carolina as a child, to Asheville as a child. But having been a part of the, the city and the community and the, and the community of Shiloh proper uh, throughout my life, I have watched Asheville go through its, its uh, period now where it's, in theory, at its peak uh, economically, but I also remember the the era of the '70s, where uh, urban renewal and and those things swept through the city and and had both positive and negative results uh, throughout the community. So when you talk about the subject of reparations, it 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 uh, evokes tremendous emotion. But I do I do not believe that uh, the solutions that will be successful for addressing it. Have, uh, will be emotional. They will have to be intellectually based. Uh, they will have to be formulaic uh, in, in, in the economic sense and, and try and make sense of the economics that were denied to citizens across time. Um, I think that I have an approach for that in mind. Ironically, as a sophomore at Wake Forest in 1982, uh, there was a conversation in a philosophy class that I participated in that um, talked about uh, reparations and was it a possibility? And, and it, it, it uh, juxtaposed the conditions of the Native American along with the African American. So it is something that I have had time to think about, uh, obviously a very long time to think about, but uh, something that I have been interested in for uh, a very long time. And, and again, I reiterate, I believe that the solutions that will that will work will will uh, there there is no way to address the emotional uh, impact the emotional scars that uh, took place during the time of slavery. However, there is uh, in a, in a capitalist society uh, there I believe there is a redress based upon economic theory, and that would be the organizational approach that I would put forward. So your application mentioned something very um, interesting to me and quite frankly, kind of sad. Um, I don't know or I didn't know Haynes Grocery Store, yes. but I've heard of it. Okay. Because um, um, I'm multi-generational um, Ashevillian as well. Can you tell me a little bit about your grandparents' store, where it was located why and how it's no longer there and what, if any, impact that has had on you and your family? Please. Absolutely. I, I think that uh, certainly it, it is personal to me and, and has special meaning. However, I do believe that the situation that uh, transpired with my grandparents' grocery store was symbolic of what was happening all over Asheville in the time of urban renewal. At the time, they owned a grocery store at the corner of uh, Pfeiffer and Blanton Streets in downtown. Today, Brown Temple Church is across the street from the lot where Brown Temple Church was at that time as well. Excuse me, please. But uh, Brown Temple Church is across the street from the lot where my grandparents' store was. And the city of Asheville, during the urban renewal program, came to my grandparents and said, we really need your property. Uh, we need to uh, make some changes here. And it's important that we have this particular piece of property, <clears throat> excuse me, that we have this particular piece of property 
to, to, to go forward with and the development plans that we have for the city. And uh, they, they made an offer to my grandparents. They were reluctant because they were at that time the last black owned business in, in, in the South French Broad, the French Broad area of town, if you will. And um, they were the last business there. And um, reluctantly, they ultimately sold. And we were fortunate. Let me be clear about that. We were fortunate. Uh, my family bought another piece of property that was already housing a small mom and pop's grocery store in the Shiloh community at the uh, intersection of London Road and West Chapel. So they from they went in uh, this this transpired in 1974, and they ultimately stayed there another 20 years at the Shiloh location and sold their business in 1994. The the the, the strange part about the storyline. Uh, the city proposed that they needed the property, that it was important, that uh, it was going to be a part of the redevelopment of downtown. And if you were to drive today, um, um, 30, 30, uh, almost 50 years later, um, that lot at the corner of Pfeiffer and Blanton that was so important to the city was never rebuilt upon. Nothing has ever been built in that place. So for something that was so important and so vital to their plans, it seems ironic that nothing was ever built there and nothing ever developed there, <clears throat> excuse me. And my grandfather, uh, rest his soul, was a very wise man. And he told me in 1974, and believe it or not, he said, there will never be anything built upon this land. This is just their way of removing the final black business from the black community. Now that's a very grim view that I'm expressing with you, but nevertheless, it was the one that was shared within my household. And so um, I have seen exactly what urban renewal did to the black community. It, 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 it removed businesses uh, where there had been thriving communities. Um, that is no longer the case. And, the, and obviously we don't have time to to, to talk about all of the factors that have impacted the black community and why home ownership and all those things have diminished across Asheville. But nevertheless, this was one of the things, this was a time period in which that all became uh, uh, the genesis of, of those changes, if you will. And so, um, as I said, we were fortunate to, to relocate and to find another spot However, that definitely, whether or not we were fortunate to find another spot, the dynamic of the downtown community in which uh, their grocery store served was never, never really recovered. And so, um, yes, we have seen, my family, we saw firsthand the, the deception, if you will, of, of, of urban renewal. So I don't know if that's a thorough enough answer, but that's, that's, that's how I see it and how it impacted my family personally, but on a larger scale, uh, what it did for the, for the community when that small black business where sometimes my grandparents offered credit to, to individuals in the community and, and Ingalls and larger markets, just not, not in a position to do those types of things. And so when you take those types of businesses out of middle size or small communities, it makes a major impact. I Hi. think we've got a couple more questions. Hi, Dwayne. Thank you so Hi. very much. I greatly appreciate you sharing this. Uh, but anyway, and, and one thing he said at the end there where he was talking about uh, the grocery store, and that was true because I remember as a young child, my mother going down to Haynes and getting the milk and, and food on cream. And, <laughs> and that made it with me so much because I remember being a part of that. And, uh, and, and, and you're right. Uh, and I do love the fact that you have history and you understand the impacts of urban renewal and you understand what reparations could actually do as opposed to uh, looking at something on paper, you are a lived experience of it. And I'm so grateful that you've applied and, um, and thank you for being here. I, I'm, I'm profoundly grateful for the opportunity. The um, store that your grandparents owned in Shiloh, yeah. Um, was that the candy store? I think we refer to it as the candy store. <laughs> a lot of folks refer to it as the candy store, 
That's but awesome. he was very diverse in, in the products that he sold. Um, the candy counter first became famous at the grocery store that was at the corner of Pfeiffer and Blanton. Um, he had, uh, I, I may be biased, forgive me if so, but he had, the, he had the best candy counter that I've ever seen anywhere. And I've been fortunate to travel a, a large part of the United States. But uh, the candy, a lot of people called it the candy store because he had a very prominent candy counter and and it had, you know, it was it was like a, 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 a parent's nightmare because all I'm sure they saw all the sugar and, and and pumped up children, you know. But uh, from the child's perspective, it was a little slice of heaven. I mean, from candy bars to hard candy to bubble gum, um, it, it 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 had it all. But he also had uh, staples that that. Uh, uh, as Miss Miss Kilgore was saying, that that the community needed uh, your, your your basic grocery store that would fulfill your your grocery order for your pantry at home. So, but but it was known in many ways in many circles as the candy store. Thank you, Mr. Richardson, and I I just like to say in closing because your time is up that the removal of that food resource from the Pfeiffer area is the reason why that census tract is called a food desert, designated as a food desert today. So thank you for all your wealth of information. It's been um, enlightening and enjoyable. Thank yes, you. Thank again. you very much. Thank you. Very important for everybody to remember their favorite candy store when they were a kid. <laughs> <laughs> your dentist liked you for it as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, next we're going to interview Dee Williams. Miss Williams, if you're there with us, there you are. If you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, which is really more for the community because we know you quite well, and um, and a little bit why you about why you'd like to serve on the Reparations Commission. Thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you. Are you able to hear me, Mayor and Council? Yes, we can hear you and we can see you. All right, thank you. It's so I'm so uh, happy to be here and so glad for the opportunity to come. Uh, I'm a native Ashevillian, as many of you know. Uh, I was born in East End. Uh, we rented an apartment in East End, and once urban renewal came, we were forced to move to um, to the west side. We moved to Buttrick Street at the corner of where Haywood Street Congregation is right now, and then we were forced to move with the policy decision of the interstate highway that came through and pretty much decimated and cut that black community in half. I was listening to Mr. Richardson and I just wanna say that every black community in Asheville had its own neighborhood store and none, his, the Haynes store was prolific. And it brought to my mind that my client bought Haynes store in 1994 and he was Bruce Gaskin who owns Asphalt Unlimited. I was detailed here to work specifically to help him contract with the city of Asheville through APAC and other highway, roadway contractors. Uh, that was my specialty. But Bruce did buy that building and was the last black owner. And we were engaged in conversations uh, about making that into a business incubator and some other things. So that's some more history. But there was no store more prolific than Porter's Grocery Store in East End. Uh, and Patterson's over in West End. And so there were stores everywhere, uh, including the Pearsons, uh, who were all Garveyites, owned by a lot of Garveyites. That's a term you don't even hear anymore. Uh, you see it and you think about Northern people, but Asheville had its own good population of Garveyites. And J.V. Miller was a Garveyite. And E.W. Pearson was a Garveyite. So we can talk, you know, I've been here, seen it all. We wrote the history. We participated in it. I was detailed here for the last time, uh, as y'all know, uh, some of you may have heard by the Minority Business Development Agency. And one of the last holdouts of major black owned property in Asheville was E.U. Jones over at 55 South Market Street. And they detailed me here from Atlanta uh, because the city of Asheville had implemented a legal action against them uh, and basically my job was to forestall that, get legal counsel and to stop that, which we did at great peril. And the last time I think the police department arrested him, his staff called me up and it's just like a nightmare. This man was 81 years old and he'd been handcuffed 
and taken to jail. And, you know, the, it's a matter of public record. So the police authority of the city has been just overwhelming. Uh, and that just sticks in my mind. But about me, I have degrees in accounting, uh, political econ e uh, economics, and another one in business administration. I'm currently the uh, president, CEO, and a uh, member of the board emeritus of Eagles Wings Community Development Corporation, which is the largest Black-owned uh, economic development organization that is Black-led in Western North Carolina, and the, lo the largest that's ever been. That's 70, over 70 churches and thousands of individuals that we represent. So it helps me be able to raise a crowd when I need to and to get them from all sectors. So I'm blessed in that aspect. Uh, I also worked on written consent to search. I work, I'm a data analyst by training as well. And we worked to get written consent to search passed by the Asheville, through Asheville City Council uh, as it pertained to reducing traffic stops for African-Americans. And we also uh, collected data and got Ian Mance from the Southern Coalition for Social Justice to uh, implement, uh, along with uh, other folks from down there, ban the box where we got the city to remove and we provided uh, uh, intellectual data and other information to, I believe, uh, uh, Councilman uh, uh, Keith Young, and we uh, got gave a model ordinance for him to turn into city. And then we went to Kurt Euler at Buncombe County and instituted at Buncombe County. And also Mission Health was our biggest success, the largest employer in Western North Carolina. And we got that. So we worked in many capacities to bring economic opportunities. There's nobody who's been around probably as long as me and is still active who uh, in, in invoked and led uh, black economic development in Asheville such as when I was detailed by the Minority Business Development Agency to help the city and county write a joint minority and women business plan. In fact, that is the ordinance that's, that was set up that carries through right now that the city is operating from. And also instituting some Community Reinvestment Act activities, um, major challenges to banks, and we have a challenge now with First Citizens, and we're working with them on a $2 million settlement for Eagles Wings and so it goes on and on. And the reason why I want to be on the Reparations Commission is that I set out the Vance Monument. And you know, when you set things out, when you sit, when you sit out, you, you can't complain. Folks did what they knew, probably thought was right. But there is a way not to divide the community uh, up and forestall anything positive. Because the resources that are being expended could have been expended on bettering or helping the cause of the black community. Most of that is symbolic and I understand what symbolism is, but I'm a pragmatist and I know how to get a deal done and I deal with money. And our problem in Asheville is one of economics. I don't wanna get altruistic nor scholastic. Sandy Darity, I've met him, I've studied under him as well as some other economists who are very prominent black ones, including Dr. David Swinton, who was the chair of the business department of Harvard man uh, who was at Jackson State and others who declare that reparations is a process that no city has the bandwidth to adequately carry out. So you're going to need to think about rebranding your terminology because you do not want to put a process of reconciliation together without telling the truth, first of all, that you don't have the economic bandwidth. It may be a violation of the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. And the sitting Chief Justice, John Roberts, has also written and ruled against uh, school districts who employed the same tactics. I'm saying a lot, but all I'm saying to you is Black folks need money. That is all this process is all about. It is about a wealth gap. It is not about altruism, philosophies, and being argumentative to the point that folks drag you into court and you expend resources, unless you're going to do it to derail the process and set it up to fail. And I, I hopefully that is not the case. We first have to tell the truth. There can be no reconciliation without truth telling. So the city does not have the bandwidth to do proper reparations. The only thing that it can do is reinvest in our community that's been previously disinvested. And I'll take any questions from you, but that's the real reason why. I wanna bring sensibility back, I wanna deliver results, and I know how to make money. No other candidate has signed as many paychecks as I have. 
And I ran construction crews in North and South Carolina. So I know how to get a deal done and I know how to bring the resources to bear to do it. So thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Dee. Thank you. I just want to let you know, I really enjoyed that. And, I'm, <laughs> and I am so on board to where you are. I am so on board because that is, that is the whole issue of the thing. We do not, it's, it's like, like you said, we need to rebrand it. We need to come from another direction. Basically, what we're trying to do is put the best way to get resources in the community to help the black community. And I don't care what it's named or whatever, but that, like you said, is a deterrent. It's going to hurt us in the long run. I talked to one of the attorneys who basically said we're looking for a lawsuit. We actually need to start addressing this and dealing with it for what it is. Uh, so thank you, sister. <laughs> Well, shoot, D, any questions for us? No. Let me ask you this. You mentioned, um, you referred to Darby Knights. Is that, are you saying followers of Darbyism as in Marcus Darby? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. These were people who were the most prominent business leaders. And let me just say that I've had the pleasure of doing oral histories with some of these very prominent people's families, like the J.V. Miller family. His daughter was over 101. It's in the Black Highlander collection at UNC Asheville and the North Carolina collection at PAC. That interview, that oral interview that we had transcribed, they confessed that their, her father was a Garveyite. Uh, the E.W. Pearson family confessed that he was too a Garveyite. These were some things that could not be put out into the public domain, but we followed every one of them through their families. And they were devout uh, Garveyites who believed in the economic destiny of the black community and they carried it out and did it well. J.V. Miller was probably the first black millionaire in Western North Carolina. And the property that the Hispanics sit on right now in West Asheville on Emma, on, on Emma Road belonged to J.V. Miller. It was the family farm. There's so much. I mean, just really, there he is. Well, thank you very much, Dee. That was our time. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon. All right, thank you. Okay, next we have um, Renetta Waters um, joining us. And if you could, I'm looking right, great, there you are. If you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you would like to serve on the Reparations Commission. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the oh, city council. Oh, I, hold on, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, I am being told by staff we have to do something with technology. Hold on, we're reconnecting the bridge. I never really know what that means. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Mayor, I'm sorry about this. We only have a four hour limit. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hit the button and reconnect. It'll take us about 60 seconds if you guys could just take a breath. Okay. Sorry about that. I knew I was gonna forget. All right, looks like we're live, go for it. Okay, good evening. Okay. All right, we're, thank you, go ahead, please, I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, my name is Renita Waters and I was born and raised here in Asheville. I have left uh, one time and then I relocated back to Asheville, my mom took ill. And so like my application states, I would like to work with the economic development, uh, one, of the, one of those impact areas because I feel like with my experience in education as being a business owner, that it has provided me the knowledge that would be helpful by serving on the commission. Okay, Do you, um, does, does anyone have any questions? Renata, how long have you uh, been in business for yourself? I've been in business for myself, 2009. Okay, and what have you been doing with your business at that time? Sort of give us a little background on your business. Oh. <laughs> okay, a little background was um, yeah. once I returned back to Asheville, I did work uh, with House, Housing Authority, City of Asheville for about a year. Then I moved on and was at um, Wachovia, then it changed to Wells Fargo. So I have the financial background. 
And then in 2009, I changed from going into banking, going into rest restaurant. And I was blessed to have a, to be able to purchase a Subway franchise. And I had two locations out in the Fairview area. One is across from Reynolds High School. And so with that, um, working with people, understanding people, being a good listener, and putting yourself in what situation they're dealing with, especially with your employees. Uh, yes, I'm quite sure that, that the experience you've had with the challenges of keeping employees and things of that nature, um, especially within the black community, maybe you could give us a background on what that what's that like? Um, it's very challenging because the rate of pay that we're paying, um, sometime working in a restaurant does not allow you to retain good quality employees. So your turnover rate is uh, very high. And so for me, myself, I've had to work hours. Sometimes I tell people, instead of me being a business owner, that I am a sandwich artist and I make more sandwiches instead of operating my business. But the challenging of maintaining employees, and as we see across the country, that most restaurants and most businesses just have the challenge of uh, hiring and keeping and attracting that employee to stay with your business. Thank you. Hey, Rainita, it's good to see you. Um, I know you had quite a bit of experience with the housing authority and in your application, of course, economic development is listed as number one, but can you delve in more deeply with um, affordable housing and housing in general um, in Asheville and any ideas you have about what that might look like from a reparations standpoint? Uh, yes, I had the opportunity to serve on the Housing Authority City of Asheville Board for, for um, no, my four, two terms, which was a total of eight years under the leadership of Jean Bell. And so being on Housing Authority, affordable housing is something that's desperately needed. Um, working with that, it also provides you the opportunity to put yourself where the residents on how opportunities are given to assist. And that was one of the things that we tried to do was assist them in how they could move out of housing. But moving out of housing also required some time income that they did not have to rent or to obtain the housing. So we tried to provide uh, programs that would assist them in saving to purchase their first home. So affordable housing is needed, um, even personally in my family. I have uh, family members who are seeking to purchase and are unable to purchase a home here in Asheville. Any other questions? This is Kim. Renetta, um, thank you so much for applying to be part of this process and for your time today. Um, as we ask our neighbors to advise in this important work around truth and healing and reconciliation, um, what it would support look like from the community and what would support look like from the city of Asheville um, for you to be able to take on this work? Um, I think the support is there. Being raised and being born here in Asheville, I am familiar with the community and the different uh, uh, members, individuals who stay in the different minority communities. The support is out there. I personally got involved in my community, the Southside Association. And matter of fact, we have a meeting on Thursday. And so I feel like the support is there and by serving on different boys here, boards in the city of Asheville, that it will help. And I feel like the city of Asheville is there to support and provide the help that we need. Thank you. Renata, I'd like to ask you another question. When you were saying you've been, you were on the housing you know, board for so long, during all that time, have you, do you think it's the housing situation has gotten a lot worse or have you seen times when you were on the housing board where it wasn't that bad or we had a balanced uh, housing inventory where it was more or less uh, 
a period of time where it was more balanced? To me personally, I feel like housing has got worse mm -hmm. as far as affordable housing. Um, and I know we dealt with the challenge when I served on the board of having a waiting list of trying to house. So to me, that shows by having a having community members wait one year, two years on a waiting list that there is not affordable housing out there. So but, we did try to work on reducing the time limit, but we just didn't have the housing available as far as standing uh, so, public housing. So are you saying that one and two year uh, uh, lit, uh, as far as being on the list, that was something that was average or is that something now that's average? I mean, has it always been like that? Would you? During the time that I served on the board, it was it was always like a one or two year waiting list. So and I don't think the time had decreased by the time that I left serving on the board. So 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 basically this situation that we've been trying to strive to to to, to correct it's um, all the work and time that's been put in it. It sort of makes you feel like, <laughs> yes, you know, our, we're not getting ahead of the game. So we really need to really look at a game plan that can actually get us more or less uh, ahead of the game because we're always behind. Yes, and, and you have individuals that have Section 8 vouchers cannot use their vouchers because there's not affordable housing for them to, um, you know, use their voucher. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Ms. Waters, for joining us today. Thank you. Okay. All right. We have one final candidate we're interviewing today, and that's Joyce Harrison. Can you hear us okay? I got you. Okay, perfect. All right. <laughs> Could you please? Yeah, sorry, that was <laughs> you worked with us. That was good. Could you please just tell us a little bit about yourself and why you'd like to serve on the Reparations Commission? Certainly. Thank you for inviting me to do this. I really do appreciate it, and I am excited about it. Um, Joyce Harrison. I am. I have a degree in business management and business administration. I worked for 21 years with the Self Help Credit Union. Uh, I was the regional director for 10 years, and I did home loans in some areas, and I did commercial lending. So I did a lot of business loans. I am interested in this because I see a lot of issues and a lot of concerns that, that affect my community that I live in. I am a native Australian. I was born and raised here in the South Side. I lived on Hibernia. We only moved because our house caught on fire and we had to move. There were 10 of us. My mother refused to separate us. So against all things that she believed in, she moved us to Hillcrest, which was an experience that we never had because we lived in a house for years. But um, it was an experience I'll never give up. All of us, the 10 of us went to college. My mother was a single parent. She raised us to be the best that we could and give all that we could. So my belief is still is today. I give all and I try and make sure that everybody has the same thing. When I worked to, went to work for self-help, I believed in the fact that everybody had a right to an asset, had a right to own, had a right to have something that they could call their own because we lost all of ours when the house caught on fire and we had to start all over again. I have worked with the city of Asheville, with the county of Buncombe. I helped create the housing trust fund, fund and I made that presentation to the city council back when we started doing all this and they approved it right at I think it was, I can't remember the year that it was approved, but I remember making the presentation to the city council and that happened. I've created numerous of loan pools throughout Western North Carolina. My job was not just in Asheville, but it was the 21 counties of Western North Carolina. So I have been in many areas, experienced many things 
and seeing many changes. Um, any questions, folks? Joyce, uh, thank you so very much for being here uh, this evening. We greatly appreciate it. And also, you know, something that you said uh, basically about being raised in Hillcrest, but yet and still all of you were able to go to college. Yes. That in itself is just, uh, it's just unheard of. Uh, that's a story that needs to be told to actually give inspiration to other people that live in housing that you can actually do better. And, uh, and, to, and that to me is just uh, <laughs> a, a blessing. And also your business, like you were saying, I, I do like the background you have in business loans and things like that, where uh, most, a lot of the people that we talked to basically talked about the need for small businesses to be able to get mm -hmm. loans and to be able to, and that, that is an area of your expertise, right? That is the area of my expertise. I did loans in ranging anywhere from $500 to $1 million. Um, I heard Dee say that, you know, money is what the community needs. She is absolutely right. The banks just don't do the loans to the communities that they should. And I'm not going to call it redlining, but I'm going to call it like it is. When I was creating the loan pools for the communities, there were special regulations that were put out there. And the banks just, just can't do it because of the regulations. Somehow, somewhere, there has to be a special funding set up for small minority businesses to have access. And the reason I say that is a lot of small businesses just don't understand how to maintain books, which is what the banks look at. They look at the financials. Small businesses don't have the know-all or whatever to do all the things that they need to do to make that work. Somehow or the other, we've got to have the training for that. We've got to have the funding for that. And then we've got to have the follow-up for that. It can't be just that you plop money down and say, this is it. It has to be followed through long term. And, and, and you're right. And the accountability piece needs to be in there. And, and the yeah. one that you said, which we knew with the mortgage industry, banks lend to people that don't need money. So we exactly. don't do that, okay? That's what banks are for. So uh, as far as it, <laughs> dealing with my business, I, I don't usually use banks. I, I, <laughs> I use alternative <laughs> financing. But anyway, but thank you so very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Hi, Joyce. This is Sage. Thank you. You're our last interview, and I love the energy that you have brought. And it was an incredible <laughs> story with you. 10 children and your poor mother, my goodness. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm a little in awe of the story. Thank you for sharing it. Um, you seem to have a little bit of an interesting edge that I haven't seen in other applicants, which is this history of commercial lending at a time when we are looking for this resource, exactly what you're pointing to. How have we failed in the past? How has the environment of lending failed in the past? And what have we been missing? And I'm just wondering, I mean, do you think in this capacity and should the entire commission get on board with this idea that you would be able to help outline and establish a program for this other funding that could turn into lending for startups and businesses with that accountability, the whole programming. Certainly, you know, th this is exactly what I did when we put together the loan pools. We had a loan pool here in Asheville. We had loan pools in the Western part of the state. I did it with Western Carolina University and we put together a whole lending program with the education before the education afterwards to make sure that the business succeeded and it continued to succeed. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, during your time with uh, Self-Help Credit Union, did you ever um, participate any, in any down payment assistant programs? Our organization did. Yes, we had a pool of money that we used for down payment assistance. We had special programs 
for people who had credit issues. Uh, we didn't always use Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae. We had on the book loans so that we were take we were taking the full risk, but the risk wasn't going out to someone else. And we did riskier loans at that point, and we still do. So I, the organization still does. I'm retired. <laughs> And thank you for helping establish the uh, housing trust fund. Thank you. I, You're I, welcome. You. Yes, we were actually talking about the program today, and and it's twenty year anniversary ish type. So yay! It's something that I've taken great pride in, as I did through the years of making sure that people had some access to, or that organizations that wanted to build homes could build homes that were affordable. Not just that, you know, you were just building a house for anybody to go into that had money, but people that didn't have money could actually have a home, similar to the Habitat program. Can you give us an idea of some other programs you have developed? Let's see. Through the years, um, Gosh, the Housing Trust Fund, along with um, uh, the Sleep Out Asheville to make sure to put the awareness out there, uh, where we had the major snowstorm that came in, the blizzard of 93, we did that full sleep out. Um, the, uh, I guess, uh, the loan pools that I put together were, they were, like I said, it wasn't just for Asheville, they were for other counties. McDowell, uh, Silva, uh, Haywood County. I have served on numerous of boards and on those boards, we've created many programs and I can't take full responsibility for creating them, but I can take some responsibility for being a part of making sure that minority communities were always included. It sounds like you usually play the advocate role. What other roles do you play um, in a group effort? And I think we're out of time, so you can answer that question and conclude. Okay, um, I do play the advocate role. I, um, I also play the role of, I've been a native of Asheville and I've seen the changes that have occurred. I like change, I like growth. I like to see a lot of things that other people always call controversy. I like to see that people are all inclusive of what they're doing and how they're doing it. And we take, you know, responsibility for it. I am the person that call that makes sure that you're responsible for what you do. If you say you're going to do it, you better make sure you do it. Thank you. Mm hmm. Thank you. We appreciate it. And sorry for the technical challenges there at the beginning. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Um, all right. That concludes our interviews of all the candidates for council's appointment. Thank you um, for council's appointment to the Reparations Commission. Again, um, council will be appointing five folks to the Reparations Commission this coming Tuesday or this coming council meeting, which I believe is Tuesday, I'm losing track of my dates, a week from today um, at uh, our next meeting. And um, uh, and that will be at five o'clock at Harris Cherokee in person um, next Tuesday. So it uh, looks like someone has, oh, Sage, you have a question? Just briefly, and it perhaps might be for Brenda. Um, what do we know about the neighborhood assignees to this commission anything it's not happened yet or yes this is brenda mills um uh we they do they are due today so neighborhoods were pre to prepare to send back to the project manager their um two representatives we know pro project housing has public housing has three representatives so we should receive those this evening um, I've actually had some calls from a couple of them just trying to make sure they got, got the right information in. But we have we should have all of those today or tomorrow. Okay, thank you. That yes, help. absolutely. What a day. Thank you everyone for your time today. 
something's All coming right, thank up you. for me. Oh, really quickly, really quickly. Something's coming up for me. Um, after we select our folks and then the county selects their group of people, I'm just wondering if we have the option of choosing alternates in case for, uh, you know, an unforeseen reason, a person cannot serve out, you know, the, the entire term, I guess is what you say. Yeah, uh, Shanique, I, I second that. Um, and one of my, one of the things that was coming up for me was when I was looking at people's availability, you know, I'm trying to envision that, you know, if, if somebody can only do it in the mornings and, you know, they can't make that work for everybody, is that going to, I mean, what will that do? So it, it might be a good idea to think about um, all alternates. And then the other question I had on adding on to that is, um, I think the county's doing kind of the same thing we are in the sense that um, we're trying to find people with expertise or input in the various uh, areas, you know, the impact areas like education and the criminal justice. Um, I, I just wonder what their timing is and if, if we shouldn't be kind of looking at who they're picking to just make sure that we have a, a team that covers all these various areas. I agree. It would help me understand the whole picture and just make sure we have some of the bases covered. Like today we heard from one person that really specialized in criminal justice, but only one. Yeah. And Vice Mayor, were you thinking a um, alternate for every or for each impact area? Yeah, yes. I appreciate that. Thank you for naming it. Um, and if the county does that as well, I mean, that's sort of a massive, um, that will be a large, I mean, it's already, it's already probably our largest commission. So that'll be kind of challenging just logistically, but, um, Maybe. and I would want, I would want the alternates to attend, uh, so they don't miss out. Right. So they would need to be paid for their time as well. We need to think about the budget implications. Um, anyway, Brenda's listening to all this. I know she's taking notes. Uh, and maybe she can talk to her county counterparts and kind of strategize around this um, and uh, come up with some thoughts about it. When we're, our brains are working a little better, I don't know about you guys, but it's been a long afternoon. So, um, all right. Okay, anything else before we adjourn or click off or whatever it's called? Okay, all right. We are then finished. Thank you. Thank you.